Hello, everybody. It's eight o'clock on a Thursday night. I feel like I should say like the you know what time you know what that means, um, but I don't even know if that's really. Um, oh, am I on? Hold on a sec. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am going to uh, join. Uh, with our guest, sorry, I just got distracted there for a second. <laughs> so anyway, it's uh, Thursday night, it's eight o'clock. Uh, we have a special guest that's going to be joining us tonight, a super special guest. And I need to make sure I get all of my, oop, that's the wrong thing. I hit the wrong button there for a second. Let me get all this back and up and running. Make sure my feed is solid. Here we go. Let's get that live feed up. There we go. Um, so I have a special guest joining us tonight. And the special guest is someone I see they've joined the the con or the they've joined uh and so i'm gonna add the special guest in in one second but i need to tell you a little secret i've been asking to get this guest on for almost two years finally they said yes so let's let them in it may take a second i'm just Whoa, 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 camera. Hello. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for those that don't know, I'm just, I'm pinning a comment here. Um, tonight we have the one, the only uh, Gina Perry coming to us live from like, I don't know, a half an hour from me. <laughs> we're not that far away. Um, thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for asking. Asking me, I feel like it's like, you know, um, Austin Powers, is it, I forget the bad guy's name, but he, he, if you ask him three times. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Eventually. Mustafa, maybe, yeah. Mustafa. Yeah, like, you'll oh, cave. I'll never tell you. Yeah. No, no, I'll tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Doodle. Um, no, we've been, we've been, uh, uh, I, I don't even remember what I first asked you. I just know I asked you a long time ago. And I was like, it's never going to happen. And then we had someone drop out this Thursday. And I was like, please, 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 please. And I wrote to you. And I, my wife um, even saw the, she gets my notifications as well. And she saw it. She's like, Gina said yes. With so big exclamation points behind it. We were so excited. Um, so uh, I have some of the books here. Some of the, uh, it's great being a dad that you helped illustrate your uh, now, not yet. There's two in this series. Uh, and then uh, we have, uh, a couple of the Avon Green books, and I realized uh, one of the ones I posted, you didn't do the cover for, but you did the interiors. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I grabbed the most recent one, but I think the ones that um, that we have I, that you did the cover for. I two covers. Yeah. I think I gave you guys the original yeah. cover. Yeah, yeah I, we couldn't find them. We think they're up in my son's room somewhere, and so I couldn't, <laughs> but I have these, these other ones that still your interior yeah. art, um, and uh, there, there's plenty more on the shelves, but I grabbed a few. But um, for those that don't know you, could you give a quick rundown of who you are? Why are you here? <laughs> sure. Um, so I'm an author and illustrator, and I live very close to Mark in New Hampshire. I started out in animation. I went to school for animation, worked in that field for a little while, and enjoyed it, but it wasn't quite the right fit. And then I was in paper products for a little while and that was kind of fun, but not quite the right fit. When I moved from Massachusetts to New Hampshire, I took um, a really cool children's illustration class. And I was like, yeah, I think this is it, but I had to teach myself a lot of <laughs> how yeah, to work, what my style was like. I used, I used to work on like colored pencil. I started out doing um, readers and educational stuff, which is great to, to learn and, you know, become more of a professional illustrator with deadlines and lots of pages in front of you. And then <laughs> kids, I started working on writing my own stories and really and enjoy that part of, of my job now too. And um, also doing like school visits. Like I find that really rewarding. Things that you don't know when you start out, like being a pretty quiet person, but like I really enjoy being in front of a ton of kids. Yeah. Do you still get nervous or is it at, at this point? No, you're just like, it's fine. No, there's like certain circumstances. I was thinking the other day I did, um, I did some events at the MFA in Boston a number of years ago. Yeah, I remember that. I got nervous because I was like mic'd and they had to make me like come into the room 
you know okay okay or out somebody like that was a little weird at first but then like once once you get into it it's it's when it's and, and i think it's you know i think it's okay like people know if you're like kind of nervous and like for school visits i always work in the fact that like i was a really shy kid like i think that's a learning moment yeah for the, the kids too the, the thing that gets me i don't really get nervous around the kids i get nervous around the adults that are in the room so it's like the teachers because i feel like Little kids are going to love whatever you do. You draw for them and they're like, they're excited that you're there. And it's, it's, you're a superstar, even though you may not be, you feel like one because of the presence that they, they sort of, or the, the response they give. But it's the adults in the room that you know are probably like in a school are probably like, oh, I got to go back and I got to, I got to deal with this lesson that I got to drill into them on math. And like, I have to sit here and listen to this thing for, you know, 45 minutes or whatever it may be. And so I get nervous in those. Teachers love of it too to be honest i always <laughs> like if it's quiet if you've got a quiet group the teachers will ask questions and it's like you know they've been thinking about it and they yeah. want to do so i don't know i think the teachers aren't what the kids ask some odd questions sometimes or they'll make some like off comments that like in the moment it's like oh like i think being a mom <laughs> helps me with some of that yeah. <laughs> how old are you things like that um i, I, always... I got a really funny one I did one a couple of weeks ago and the girl was like you know I think you could really do this professionally <laughs> and and I, I knew that she kind of meant something different yeah. so I did like I could see a teacher on the side being like I need to like step in because that was offensive but I was like oh I'm like do you mean like fine art like because she's like you're like really good I was like thank you I'm like I, I mean like fine art I was like you know and then it gave me a moment to explain how illustration is different from being yeah. in a gallery, you know, but. I, uh, I love, I honestly like want those questions more than anything because I feel like you can have a funny response to those and say like, oh, like, thanks for, thanks for the vote of confidence. I've been questioning that and like, like to play into it and act it up for them. And of course the teachers know that like you're playing into it, but um, so I know that, uh, I mean, I know enough about you in general and your work and, and things of the sort, but uh, I know that we can have a deeper dive into sort of the history because I don't know all the history. Like I know some of the stuff that you've done and talking about some of the like the educational and the reader stuff or uh, some of the surface design things and how that sort of relates and connects and, and sort of the process. Um, but uh, the, the, the initial things that I always say just, and you've probably heard it on here before. One, you can leave whenever you want to leave. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to turn off right now and you're like, I'm done, that was enough. Uh, <laughs> I made, I made my, my uh my appearance that's okay uh i won't be offended two uh what are we going to work with tonight because i know you're primarily digital and that's okay it's a matter of if uh sort of i see aj just joined up and said hi again uh <laughs> aj put into the the facebook chat check out mark's stories before it goes down and i was like what is he talking about and then i finally like 10 minutes later it connected i was like oh He's just promoting tonight. <laughs> I had no clue because the first thing that came up was a thing that said like story is not available or something. Like, it was something oh, weird. Oh yeah. Well, my, and I was like, face too. You're yeah. Probably like, wow. yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, Vita's watching too. Um, so uh, are we working on the computer tonight? So, so that really threw me off too. So I I cleaned I cleaned my I have a I'm very blessed at this point because I used to work in like a corner. Yeah my studio has gotten just moved around so many times but i have this really nice downstairs space which is where i work all the time but i also have um an art room that i share with my daughter who we are very like polar opposites much like mo and peanut in terms of messiness <laughs> so i like i cleaned it thinking i was going to work in there and then i got sidetracked because i started drawing um yeah. that i think will be like a postcard okay so i think i'm I'm going to be digital. Um, Christian, I'm going to pick up the, give you a little, little tour. Is this a postcard for the, uh, the Kid Lit I think for, for, Shout out to Kid Lit Art postcard. Um, oh. Yes, I think so. So I actually had the option to do both because at first it was like, like, I don't know how your setup is, but like I was using like a plastic bucket and then like a tripod. Oh. like. Okay. Yeah. Duck I got a ring down. light on a, on an arm that clamps to the desk. It's super easy for me. Now but... I have, am I doing this right? So oh yeah. <laughs> my husband nicely made me this. This was my addition really. It's just a counterweight, but Perfect. you know, he, 
he screwed through a, a hole, cut a piece of wood. I, so I can, I can work on my Cintiq. That was a long yeah. form answer of I can work on my Cintiq tonight. And I, I mean, I work digitally and I like, I, I know almost everybody you work with usually is on like regular media and I might start out sketching that okay. way because I have all my stuff too. Like I have my, we all have the Ikea drawers. I have my, what's in here, Everything. five million art supplies all around. Um, I it's funny, I, there, there are a lot of, of traditional people, but I've also, I go through like spans where there's like 10 people in a row that are all digital. Oh really? Sudden, yeah, it, if you go back and watch some of them, there is like these sequences where I'm like, wow, it's digital, digital, digital. And all of a sudden I'm going, oh, I'm really old and antiquated because I'm not using digital. And then all of a sudden I'll get like five people that are traditional or people that are going into the sort of analog um, uh, media. And so like all of it's fair game. And I think it's it's good. The only thing we have to watch out for digital ever is just glare. And that's about it. Yeah, I think when it crops, it's going to crop. I have a little glare spot that's on the top. Okay. But I think it'll... It'll okay. be cool. Thank you. And I even, when I first started out, I had, it looks very similar. I had a, a uh, when I was doing down shoots and sort of time lapses, I had a big giant wooden, I don't even know, like pole that came up and another wood piece that was drilled into it. And then a car, one of those mounts for your car that you would uh, like attach to your vent in your car for the phone. And that's what was on it. And I, you know, taped it to it and clamped it to it. And it was fine, but it just wiggled so much that eventually I was like, I need to get something that's a little bit more steady uh, than, than that uh, sort of uh, jerry rig thing. But um, okay, so we're going digital. Uh, for the, those that don't know as well, because we mentioned it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're the person that started Kidlit Art Postcard. Yeah. Yes, I started yeah. Art Postcard in, I think, 2021. Sounds about right, yeah. Yeah. And now there's millions of posts and like crazy amount on that thing. <laughs> yeah, I forget because I, I had to look it up for something the other day. I, I forget how many thousands that, that are there, but from like nothing, because like I had to find a hashtag that had nothing yeah. reattached to it. I'm sorry, it's very long, but that was, <laughs> that was what we had to do to get a, a hashtag that was clean. But, um, and starting next month, I believe, I'm sorry, I don't remember, it's in my stories, but um, an artist from Germany reached out and <coughs> asked about starting something in Germany that's kind of along those lines, but like has a different hashtag and uses a different day. So there's no yeah. crossover there. But I was like, yeah, go for it. How cool is that? That's awesome. So that's a phrase today for any of our German illustrator friends. I think that's really cool. I don't know what other markets have like enough to like <coughs> really like focus in because I know ours is international. You can see the posts that come yeah. in like hours. Yeah. I think that's a pretty smart idea. If you've got like a little niche, it gives you a little more attention, right? The, the, the amount that that sort of blew up and like, I mean, I've talked to people around the world and they're all like, oh yeah, I got a post for that. And like, it, it's interesting that, um, and I, it's, it's odd to me uh, how fast it spread when it's, and I, not because it's not a great idea, but just like, it seems like it was sort of like, let me just start this thing. And all of a sudden I felt like a month later, everybody's like, oh, are you posting something on that? I'm like, what? I didn't even know about it until someone else mentioned it to me. And I was like, oh, interesting. And I looked it up and I was like, oh, you started. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? Um, and I love uh, the, the sort of reach that it has. And I know there's art directors and people that are looking at it on a regular thing. So uh, uh, kudos to you and thank you for starting that because I know it is very helpful. Uh, and for anybody that doesn't know, it's the first Thursday of every month. First Thursday of every month. There's no theme. People sort of generally follow whatever themes happen in the months. Like we'll probably get a lot of Valentine's yep. things in February and back to school and then Halloween, September and October. Or, um, yeah, there's no real structure or rules. Yep. It's just use your smarts and like look at what other people have posted and like probably should put your name on the image. Yeah. <laughs> give some info about like where's your website, <clears throat> things like that. Really, I used to... There's enough stuff out there now that you should be able to just like look at what's been posted with the hashtag. And, and it's across all different media. Like sometimes I'll post on LinkedIn because you just really never know. It, it really was born out of frustration I was busy at the time that I started it, but somebody, um, an editor made a post about um, how like mailboxes were closed for COVID. And she yep. was like, you can't sell postcards, just just post your work online. And it was like, 
just post your work online. It's so hard. What does that mean? Yeah. You need a focus and you need to target. So over the course of the weekend, I was like, I think this is like a really easy idea, but like you just had to have the confidence to like say like, I think this is, and I checked with friends and I checked with an editor. I was like, hey, is there a particular day of the week that's best for editors? You know, that type of thing. And Thursday is the... It out. And I was like, is there any like backlash like this is going to have on me? Because you want to think of yeah. like what could happen in, in a negative way. Um, and the only negative thing that really happened was that I forgot to, people were, were so grateful that they tagged me on Twitter. So I got tagged on, on like 500 posts in one day and that like I couldn't even like look at my Twitter. It was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't look through my notifications. So I learned yeah. to notify and then be like please don't tag me and stuff um, <laughs> so, but other than that it was like I, I really wasn't expecting it to be one to, to kick, kick my butt into making my portfolio more relevant like you forget as you get older and you're busy that like you still need to like work on your own personal pieces it gets harder to make that a priority but like I feel really personally responsible <laughs> so I'm like I have to post yeah. <laughs> if you don't do it then uh, <laughs> then it's not working for sure yeah. I, one of the things I, I was, um, and we'll, we'll get into art making people. So just bear with <laughs> for a second. I was talking to my students today and one of the assignments that I give them is um, they have to do, it's a, it's a promotional material assignment that they have to do at some point in the semester. And I was telling them about it and they have to do one of three or two of three things. One is a business card, one is a postcard, and one is a social media blast. And the you know business card they all understand postcard they they'll learn about sort of how that works and why you would use those and in fact i've seen art directors that have said like because of covid now they're not getting things to hang up in their office anymore and i was like oh that's interesting because i you know you think of it as being like antiquated and now all of a sudden it's like they have barren walls so they do need both at the yeah. same times but the social media blast a lot of them go like so I just put an image on Instagram and I'm like, no, this is like, it's bigger than that. You got to do stuff. Like you were saying that you reached out to art directors and asked about what the best day is for doing something like this. Those kind of like research, what hashtags you use, how you plan. So like even the equivalent of, um, I always do my Stinktober in October. And so we did Stinktober 2023 this year, but then some other person used the same hashtag Yeah. and it wasn't specific. It was fine for like the first week. And then all of a sudden someone else out there used it and all of a sudden it was populated with totally was different it, stuff. And so I got a not illustration. It was illustration, but it was it was not the same theme. Yeah, it wasn't my prompt. So it was all these other random things that were coming up and you know, more power to them. I just know next time I have to put some extra things into it or make it longer. And we we added to it from what we did the first year to try to prevent that we have to make it even longer. And it's like learning these things about how to communicate with uh your sort of broader international audience or with art directors that are really important for people um okay so are you gonna make something for a kid lit art i am postcard i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna sketch for a couple minutes and then i'll switch to the digital thing okay just out of um i feel guilty if i'm only doing digital do you know what it's gonna be yet or is it sort of oh, gonna figure it out oh yeah we have to start. um so did you you saw what i posted before right yes uh, yeah. so I was the other night I was sketching foxes so I think I might get back into sketching because I had a couple of cute guys I wanted to like kind of work on the character a little bit and then yeah. when I go to my postcard I was shout out to um, Beth and introvert drawing club so we did a, a, a toy based one a while ago yeah. and I had the pink poodle toy that I drew and I was just like looking through my sketchbooks today I'm like I keep drawing poodles and pink like over and over again so I was like writing ideas down and I thought man that would be cool if that was a big statue like don't you just want to see a big pink poodle statue and like <coughs> all these little guys around it sort of worshiping idolizing they're worshiping it or they're just like being obnoxious around it a little bird on its head put a bird on it but then I was like okay more kid lit focus would be pink poodle party and if like the poodles took over so i think that's what i'm going to do for my postcard because then it's like valentine's -y with the pink i was uh, i was wondering in the sense of like uh it sounds very similar in a way to what i was planning on doing and we didn't pre-plan this of any sort um that i'm planning on doing dinosaurs dancing around a volcano that's erupting so they think it's a party but it's actually yeah. The end times. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's a little hidden message there. But I was going to ask it, and in a way, you already answered it. Of like, are these 
how do you approach these? And we can talk about this even deeper, but this, the idea of, are you, when you make promotional images, are you making them just because they're fun or are you planning, like, does it have a narrative theme to it? Like, what are the, the criteria in which, what makes an image that's better for something like the hashtag versus just something that goes on your site and sort of like overthink things. And I, sometimes I overthink myself out of a lot of good ideas. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes it's like, like I, there's like that little cross. I don't know if you have it. I don't feel like you're like this, but like I get to a point where I'm like, no, just go for it. Because if you think too, too much about like market and what do I ha not have in my portfolio, you kind of miss the fun and the yeah. joy. And especially with kids, work i feel like if you're not if you're not going with like what makes you happy and what is like really getting you excited and is funny and weird like it starts to not not be not, fun <laughs> it, it, it won't yeah. end well it has yeah. to no it's 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 good to know like that i mean i overthink things not necessarily on the like the sketching side yeah. of things but i overthink the like ramifications after the fact yeah of like okay i made this thing is this good enough? Why is this something I should change out something on my portfolio? And I get way too deep into that side of things. And then sometimes even the equivalent, I think everybody goes through this, you sort of, you make something and all of a sudden you're like, I love it. And then two seconds later, you're like, oh, I don't like this anymore. And there's something wrong with it. And so it's, it's always a gamble, but I'm going to make something I think this will be for that day. Uh, and I too have purples and pinks to sort of get us in nice. there. So, um, Let's jump into making, let's take a second and set up our cameras uh, and then we'll jump in. I even see there's some questions that we can start to sort of jump into as we go along, but let's, let's get our camera set up. I know you probably need to tape some stuff down and, and uh, drill some of that stuff into the wall. I don't think I do. <laughs> when I lost the dog, I promised everybody a Hank. Oh yeah. Before I switch. Hank. Gina has a, a pug. Come here named Hank that is that is adorable and we bought some of those sweatshirts because we have a a pug chihuahua mix oh little he's, Hank. he's stopping at the threshold because I don't have a treat for him he's very food motivated i.e not, not not obedient except when there's food involved but uh Gina has a has had Hank for I don't know, how long have you had Hank, Hank is can I just I can't flip this around oh, I can flip it around oh Hank Hank is now five years old yeah he's a pug he's got kind of a small head for a pug but you know we started doing the daily Hanks as part of um the whole COVID being stuck at home thing and I don't do them daily anymore but usually I yeah, can get a good yawn out of them too you like to give yourself challenges of doing the the hashtag stuff and now daily hanks uh, <laughs> you gotta you gotta slow that down um we my wife now that we have the the little dogs we're like always uh lauren's always taking photos of them so she started mayo mondays where she's every monday posting a picture of mayo and i'm trying to get her to call the other one because we have two dogs that are small the other one's noodle yeah and i want her to call them nudie pics <laughs> And they can be posted on whatever day makes sense. But I just think the term nudie pics and it's just pictures of that dog would be very funny. I'm um, sure she's not listening to you about that at all. Because oh, she's, she's, I don't know if she's going to put up with me with that, but um, I don't know if it would sell well either. But uh, you, you did inform us about some great clothes for little dogs like that. Yes. And so we have, uh, yes. Yes. we have purchased some of those and they are wonderful. Um, they have kind of weird shaped bodies. So those spark paws yeah. fit pretty Get those, well. Uh, the right like size and proportion for them because they're, yeah, they are, they are odd in their arrangement. I just realized I didn't have my light on. There we go. Um, so I'm going to set up my camera here and then we'll just start going. But I did see there was a question. Let me see if I can get to that question real quick. Um, I'm always set up. So this is uh, Dory Doodle SCL, Dory Doodles CL. That's my guess. It says, how long roughly does it take for you to illustrate a book? Do you work on multiple books at a time? And then what are the benefits of self-publishing versus publishing companies? So let's, let's start with the first one. With making a book, um, you, you know, there, there's a difference between every artist and, and sort of the materials they use and how long it takes them. But can you estimate to the best of your ability? <laughs> sure. What sure. Yeah. 
for a picture book, the final art usually takes me two to three months. Okay. But you know, the, I think the bigger factor, which is what I'm dealing with right now is like, how long are you waiting in between the different yep. steps that happen? So that can drag things out for quite some time. Hold on I mean, I've, I've found everything from like, I've got notes back in a matter of a few weeks, which is wonderful, but most of the time it's notes back in a month. And so all of a sudden you do have multiple projects that that second question of like, are you doing multiple things? Um, yeah. You do have that, like, I got to wait for these notes before I can move forward. And do you have something else on your plate? And so it is good to sort of multitask and to have, you know, various projects at different stages because you always have room to sort of deal or, or you have projects to fill up that time where you're waiting. Um, I'm actually, uh, the, the two to three, uh, two to three months is pretty standard, I think, for most people, but there are folks and I don't, I don't understand how they manage it or it takes them, you know, like six months to a year to illustrate a book purely just on like, do they get paid more or is it just, they like, they take the cut, the pay cut because of it. Um, the, uh, what was the final question? Oh, publishing versus self-publishing. What are your thoughts? Um, I think when I was starting out many years ago, self-publishing was a different, different animal. So I feel like a lot of people really make it work for them now. I personally don't do it. Um, cause I just, I love being able to work with a whole team. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's like three, three steps higher. Your book is going to get at least in, in terms of the quality from working with publishing professionals who know, yeah. who know their stuff. Um, but yeah, I've had friends that do it and it's worked out well for them. So I can't really tell you, I haven't, I haven't done it myself, but yeah. make sure you I mean, get paid. Yeah. The, it's, it's interesting because I like, I was talking to someone today about it and there are instances and we all hear those instances where, you know, someone had a, a, a idea for a picture book, they self publish it. And then a publisher saw it and said, let's turn this into a, a traditionally published book. Yeah. Um, and that's wonderful. That's rare. Um, but I think the challenge that I've always had with it, cause I've had, I had someone ask me today, like, do you do that? Do you do work on self published things? And I don't, and it's not, um, because I have an issue with self-publishing as a concept. Yeah. I have a problem with the idea of the logistics that go into it and what would be my involvement in those logistics. So like the equivalent of, um, you know, how does the money get dealt with? Because it, you're going to have to market this thing and you're going to have to go out there and, and sort of hustle to get your book seen. Yeah. Whereas a, a traditional publisher is going to take them out and, you know, sell them around town essentially. Um, and so I've always sort of hesitated because I just don't have the time or effort or uh, willingness to put that kind of, you know, uh, uh, or to do that due diligence to make sure that the book is being seen. And then I'm already cutting the book short. Yeah. And it doesn't sound fair to anybody that's involved with it if I'm already doing that. Um, it, with, with, uh, with self-publishing too, for those that don't know, I mean, when the people that you know that have done it, are they people that are doing sort of print on demand or are they doing like buying stock? Well, I've known illustrators that will illustrate somebody else's book. Yeah, right? so it's not on them. Yeah. And that's a matter of making sure that like you get paid and you've got a, you know, a fair, a fair deal. But I have known people to do both part. Oh no, no, no. She was the author. Um, she's not that far away from either of us and she just like she was such a boss at it of like finding getting it printed i think she did pod i think she did print on demand but like even knowing how to get your book reviewed like yep. i would not have guessed that her work was self-published because you know it just it looked 100 percent trade but it's like it's almost like it's a full-time job oh absolutely, absolutely. before yeah. even, before you even like potentially publish the book, you're having to do lots of groundwork to get it even sort of in front of people. Um, and, and I absolutely love the idea of like the freedom of it, but I just don't know if I could ever sort of um, be mindful enough and uh, be willing to give up that much of my time towards that part of it. Yeah. I mean, see, you, your website, do you use a, a template site like Squarespace? Or I anything? do. I I use Squarespace. Yeah, I was I was telling students today 
because students, you know, every once in a while I have a student that goes, well, I want to code my own site. Oof. <laughs> yeah, my, that's my reaction too. It's like, I understand that it's, it's fun to go in there and like design it so it doesn't look like everybody else's. But I had experience doing that when I was younger in my career. Yeah. But when I did it, I spent yeah. more time trying to figure out how to code and then dealing with bugs yeah. in the code yep. than actually making artwork. And same thing with the publishing side. Like I'd rather just spend my time making yeah. artwork and not having to. Yeah, yeah. I think there's probably certain cases. Like I was pretty close to, I don't know if you know my my mini doodle drawing books that I yeah. came out with last yep. year. Yep. I was like close to, because <laughs> we put those on sub and it got a, a couple of really good nibbles. But because the format was so different, it just was, you know, the combination of the COVID years where everybody's a little bit more cautious and it didn't fit a, a format that publishers use for that. Um, it sat on the shelf for me for a while before I went back to it. And then it definitely occurred to me, I was like, I know I could publish this. Like I've got the skills to like do the designs side of it and it wouldn't have been that much work. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's the getting it, getting it sold side that you're like, what's the point if I can't get it, can't get it sold. So luckily I found the right person for it. It just the the, time, but. the and it, it's you know more power to the people that want to go out there and do any of this this work because oftentimes it really does pay off if they put the time and effort into it but I just it's so hard and there's I mean one of the challenges I've had and this goes for anybody that's a writer that's listening is making sure that you know I, I because I teach I have lots of can a student do this can a student do that and it it sounds wonderful, but if the student is being taken advantage of or they're not being paid enough, uh, is very, very hard for me to go out there and say, yeah, well, let me give this to a student to try. Um, yeah. So like, there's all sorts of things that go into the self-publishing on that side of, of, yeah, you can get something for less money if you have someone new, but at the same time, is that fair to them? And, you know, it's again, like, it it's silly because I don't like the idea that it comes down to sort of like price and money yeah. and things of the sort. But I also think it's not fair to the people involved if you're not being considerate of that and their time yeah. and those those ends of it. Um, so let's let's go back to the beginning. Let's talk a little bit about sort of history. So animation was the start. Yep. And you said it wasn't for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I worked in it a couple of years. I worked as a compositor. Um, where, where, where was so that? I was I worked at a, a company called Olive Jar Studios. That's right. Uh, right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I knew this. In the Boston area. Yep. And it was a lot of fun and I learned a ton. Like when you're fresh out of college, you've got no clue, right? Yep. Like you just don't know it. And when I, so I went to Syracuse and I went for computer graphics and I studied a lot of, um, like I took my core animation stuff, but then all of my studios were like drawing and painting. <laughs> and yeah. I tried really hard to get into the illustration classes, but they were so full of the kids who were in the major that like a professor literally laughed at me one day as I was standing there with my like my form to get into oh. the class. He was like, oh, no, 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 that's not going to happen. So I was like, okay. So I, I had an inkling that that's what I was interested in. It just, you know, that's the way it works out. But um, were you at all? Olive jar when it finally closed? I, I scooted out smartly like maybe six months or a year before it it's it had like some weird it got acquired by somebody I think yeah but I think I worked there for maybe a year and a half and I started out as an intern and then I got hired um, they hired everybody on like a weekly basis um, per diem per project or whatever yeah. um, so you know that the late 90s were not a bad time to be starting out <laughs> and living in Boston like you could afford you could afford you know rent and things like that not not too challenging even getting paid pretty poorly um, and then it was a little bit, bit like hectic they laid they you know they're like we don't have work so I had to go get a um, I worked at my my mom worked at an HMO for a long time so I worked and did you know temp there one summer and that was awful keying medical claims um, <laughs> Wait, did, I, did you just name what was awful the company? I don't think I named them by name, and she's retired, oh, so it's okay. okay. <laughs> the company's the company's fine, but like it wasn't for me to sit there for forty hours and yeah, and key okay. medical claims over oh, and over again. Medical. I was I was thinking the name of the company was oh, key no, medical no, claims. No, no. That's what threw me. Okay, okay. When, no, when, no, no. 
real quick, like, when you were at Olive Jar, like when you're there? doing this with the key with the yeah. ten keypad on the side, you're gotcha. just entering numbers gotcha. like for eight hours a day with your headphones on. It was just um, when you were at Olive Jar, were you there past two thousand? Um, I think maybe a couple months past two thousand, and then. A bunch of us cut bait and went to a, um, a game company that was based out of Springfield, Mass. Okay. And we okay. we we had like a whole like we worked on like a investor pitch that was 3D for a really long time. That was pretty boring. And then we switched over to a um, a fishing game that was attached to like a, a like a, a rod and reel that you <laughs> would actually like cast like a physical product. Yeah. Um, so I I did, did like a ton of like you know crab and fish um 2d you know 3d skin type stuff like that was that was a lot um and then i did some freelance stuff the freelance stuff was really fun i worked with um these like we couldn't have asked for a nicer um couple of ladies i lived outside harvard square and they lived and worked in at harvard and they were canadian filmmakers and they um that's yeah. that's the nice part right there that, that they it wasn't even a choice they were automatically they, nice because they were from canada they were automatically nice i kid you not they like they baked cookies every afternoon in a little toaster oven we would have cookie time and i would sit there and composite it was a commercial and it, it, it won an award it was great um it did give me a bit of a shoulder injury because i wasn't working in the right desk yeah. setup um, but they were just lovely, and that was a really nice project. And then I went out to Western Mass to a company called Kleiser Walzak. Um, and I was their compositing lead for um, a 3D ride film at Bush Gardens in, where's Bush Gardens? Uh, Carolina, North Carolina? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Williamsburg. <laughs> Excuse me, Williamsburg, okay. Virginia. So they had their Ireland theme park ride. If anybody has ridden the Ireland theme park ride, <laughs> wait, it was it was like one of those giant screens. You can still find it online. It's really funny because it's like late '90s 3D animation. And you said Not, Ireland. It was for the Ireland. You know, like William, they do like um, different country themes. It was for Ireland, oh, so it was okay. like a lot of oh, Irish okay. folklore stuff. But yeah. so I moved. Like I moved moved out to the Berkshires for a couple months and I worked out there and that was, that was an experience. It was, it was really fun at first. And then like all the animators left and all the other people left. And then it was just me, like the compositor at the end. <laughs> um, just crying that you don't have the same cookie people making you cookies every day. There were no cookies. There was ping pong, um, uh, but nobody to play with at the end. Cause it was just me. Like everybody else finished their work and, and went home so um so the but, but i i realized when i was out there towards the end of my job i had two weeks that i worked 100 hour weeks oof okay and like there was no avoiding it it was just a hot mess and i, I remember sitting outside when there was like a couple of people left my buddy mark was out there and i was like i just want to be an illustrator <laughs> It was like a breaking point moment. And it's truly, it's what I wanted to do. It just it was one of those things that felt like I couldn't say it. I didn't know where to start with it. And it took what? me a long time to get there. But I, I knew that like that was not the right fit for me. And it, obviously having worked 200 hour weeks in a row was pretty <laughs> rough on, on the emotions. When, but. when you say you, you felt bad saying it, was it because, you mean that because you were at that job and you felt bad saying it? when you were at that job or you, was there a, another concern in the sense of like, well, you didn't go to school for this. And oh yeah, yeah. Just a lot of like, I'm just such a practical person that it's like, I'm in this field, I'm making good money. Like I've always yeah. looked at illustration as like, I don't know, that seems like really tough and very, very competitive, yeah. right? Like it's, yeah. Not it's, for the faint of heart. And then picking children's illustration on top of that, boy. <laughs> but I think I always kind of slanted towards um, kids' media anyways and all the work that I did, so. Oh, wait, are you saying that you think that kid lit is, is a tougher genre or, or more challenging or? I, not that I can't I, say I that because I bet they're all hard at this point, but. <laughs> yeah. You know. What, what, what do you, 
and I see there's there's questions I want to I want to jump back to at some point here. But um, what was hard about it? And I'm not saying it's easy of any sort. I'm not I'm not <laughs> disagreeing with you that it's, that's hard. But um, for those that are interested in jumping in, like how can we help them um, avoid the pitfalls or sort of give them knowledge about what was hard for you, at least in your sort of subjective case? I think what was hard for me at that point, and I think it's very different now, was that I, I just didn't even know where to start. Okay. You know, I think when you leave okay, college, and I, yeah. I, I remember talking to, when I've talked to your students when they're graduating, um, doing those portfolio reviews, like that was a really challenging thing for me was, um, when you graduate and you like, you're untethered, you lose your community, especially yeah. if you go to school, like in it, like I was out of state and I like, I came back home and I was like, I don't know who to talk to about stuff. And especially at that point, it wasn't like social media was, was a thing. It was like, how do I even print my stuff for this interview? Like things were mm -hmm. just so much harder once you leave that campus. So I think I, I kind of like say that, and I know it's very different now, but so it was, it was hard once I left another, like I was successful in this career, like, oh, I'm going to start over. And I knew I had to put a lot of work in to be good. You know, like you just, what's that, the thousand hours thing or 10,000 yeah. hours? It's like, you know, like this is a long path before you find how good you want to be at it. You know, did, um, did you have folks that you turned to for, for sort of resource purposes or, I mean, I know that for the same for me, like I had a different career but, or a different, I mean, I was illustration and, and animation and things of the sort prior, but uh, jumping into Kidlet, there was a lot of things to learn in that process. And I know that there are lots of people that have been helpful, uh, yourself included, that have given me lots of information. Even to this day, um, I feel like I'm asking people, uh, and you know, you helped me with some of the like cliff uh, stuff recently. Oh, and so yeah. like, did, you, did you have people that became your resource or was it you were really out there just uh adrift no i think i think from that moment where i had like a you know a, a meltdown at that those at the animation job i was adrift until i took a class and then i lucked out so much because i met this lovely group of people like my teacher was awesome i'm still in touch with her um marion eldridge she lives down in um in massachusetts um she no i don't think she's i think she's retired but um but she was like such a great resource going into it because she was like no nonsense like hey you're gonna have to learn how to do something over and over and over again like you might finish a piece and then you have to go back and redo it and sure enough like in her class i'm like oh i had to do that um but she really told you like it was she did mostly ed work and then i met a great group of ladies and that was my first critique group and we're all still um friendly and in touch you know yeah. good good, really good lifelong friends from that group. So I think just being in like, like a really welcoming community up here was like a huge help. Then joining SCBWI. Yep. Which, I mean, when you're getting started, I don't see what else is out there like that. Um, it's maybe a little different now in terms of like, do you have the same type of in-person events, depending on what region you're in? Um, yeah. And, if and I do, I have... I have like a list of resources when people ask me because I get a lot of like self pub or like um, new to the industry questions. I definitely send them like things that maybe don't cost as much as yeah. joining, you know, um, yeah. here's depending a, on what you're interested in. There's, there's a, a book lot of free resources that, yeah, too. That gets out there. Yeah. Um, one of the, one of the, uh, Andy, I see you said cliff stuff. Well, I'll have to tell you later. It's, it's more complicated than just a, a quick thing, but here, but it's about school readings and uh, for New England, especially Northern New England, uh, that Gina was uh, informing about that other people, uh, I forget what his name is that's here in, in New Hampshire. I think that every school is like, oh, oh he's visited. Marty Kelly. Yeah, Marty yeah, Kelly. Mar that, Marty goes, if, if you were at a school, Marty was just there a week before you yeah, usually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, um, he's an awesome guy. He's actually been a really good resource because I knew him when I was working at the scrapbooking and stationery company, I actually met Marty and we, we almost had crossover at Olive Jar because he did something for Olive Jar like a year or two before I was there, which is funny, but. Um, 
but it, that networking side, I mean, this is that thing where like, uh, I deal with students all the time. They're like, you know, shy, like you said, or they're, they're reserved. And then you say, you got to get out there and meet people. And it's like, this is the, the prime example of that. Like you need sometimes someone, even though you, you've been trained how to illustrate, you may not have been trained to, uh, uh, to converse with people about sort of how you manage your day-to-day -day, uh, promotions and everything of that sort. Um, let me see, there was some questions. Let me go back to the, because there's a couple of questions that I think uh, were sort of interesting. And I really loved one of them, uh, I think. Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, it is from uh, G Marina, no, Mariana 2010. Says, hi guys, I hope this makes sense. How can I make my illustrations more fun? Now, it's a weird question because we don't know the illustrations off the top of our head, but sort of thinking about that idea of like, how do you make an illustration, not just an image, but how do you tell a story? How do you, like, are there things that you do in particular to help your images become more fun or, or exciting to you? I just stuck the tongue out on this fox and I feel like that, that did something. <laughs> um, yeah, I think a lot of it is like going back and looking and like, and do it early, do it when you're sketching. Don't do it when you're like really married to like, ah, oh, it's all painted now. Yeah. Um, when you're sketching stuff, like really look at like, is there action? Is there like anything unique about this character, whether it's the way it's physically designed or like how it's dressed? I think I mean, look to look to who it, who you like, who do you whose work do you love and what, you know, sit there and try to drill down like, what are they doing that I'm not doing? Like, is it about the colors they're using? Is it about the action? And there's probably something that's like your strength, right? Yep. Like you're probably really good at, you know, the funniest outfits on your characters and they're all dressed really wild. Like some people that's their thing. And some people it's like really over the top dynamic posing, right? Like they get their characters in just wild positions. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to be, you don't have to be able to do everything under the sun in order to no, make a good no. image but knowing where your strengths are and playing to those strengths. Like, I don't, I don't think I'm a good action person. I don't think any of my images are really like sell. Here's a big action where I find my strength is in sort of shape design and color and texture. Yeah. And so like it, I don't know as it's like, I look at this image and go, wow, they're having a party. But I look at, hopefully I look at my images and go, wow, that makes me feel like a party because of those things. Um, because yeah, of, of yeah. Play. And so uh, it really becomes a question of like, what does fun mean? But I think the big thing that I would add in to that, to what you already said, and I agree with everything is what makes, what is fun to you and what makes you laugh? What makes you giggle? What makes you uh, smile when you look at your illustration? And if you can make yourself smile more than likely someone else is going to. And so like, for me, it's that same thing. Like you, you made the tongue stick out. Like things for me that are funny. In fact, when I do the dinosaurs on this tonight, um, I'm gonna reference some illustrations that, not even illustrations, some drawings that I did when I was three years old. Uh, <laughs> uh, because I loved the shape of it. Like I just didn't know, as, as a reference point here, I'll draw on the board. Uh, it was essentially a Pac-Man shape with some teeth, a couple of eyes, stick legs, and then a little triangle tail. And I don't even remember if it had spikes up the back, but that was a Tyrannosaurus <laughs> rat, right? Yeah. And it's like, I just didn't know what I was doing, but I love the like simplicity of it and the irregularity of the shape. And so I'm not gonna be the person that's gonna go in there and draw this like really super realistic, every little texture that's on a, a T-Rex that's in here. I'm gonna be the person who goes in and says, okay, what's a really funny shape that's gonna make that work for me? And if it makes me laugh, then I know that I'm doing justice to the idea that I'm trying to get across. Um, is there, are there certain things in particular when you, um, when you are illustrating that do make you sort of uh, more excited about your imagery? Um, I like a good strong composition, you know, like I like something that's really dynamic, whether it's like 
a play on scale or like a sharp angle. Like I think I, I fiddle around, like I know I can make these characters funny and interesting, but I want to like fit everything in a way that like there's action or there's something about it that's, I think, I think that's sort of like my, I don't know if that's the fun, yeah, the fun for me, but that's always like really important and takes, takes a lot of time for me to figure out is like that composition type stuff. The, um, I see there's, there's a couple comments here that I want to, I want to address real quick. Um, uh, in the questions, which I, I, it's on my phone that I can see it. So I have to stand up here for a second to read. Yeah. Um, there's two questions or no, three questions. One, um, from Cass was here, which is a, uh, a former student, uh, who says, how often do I make new collage paper? Do you have a stash? Uh, I, every illustration that I do with it, I make a new bunch of it, but I pull, I have a big stash to the side. My, you showed some of your studio and how lovely and organized it was. You don't want to see this studio. <laughs> uh, it is. A nice well, that was my art room that I cleaned up today. Oh, okay. I, I do collage work and I do the collage work up there because yeah, okay. uh, you cut, you cut paper and it's just everywhere, especially like I, I'm a big like bathrobe or blanket person. So it's like, it gets stuck to me and then it trails out the hallway. Yep. Um, the, but the my, of... my, da my daughter does like every media you can think of it's it's in that space it's hot glue it's foam it's fur it's slime like like so that like it's just like oh it we, like the table used to be clean and then it was like <laughs> as long as i know that that's like not my primary space like i'm okay with yeah. it. the amount of the amount of collaged paper that has come up the stairs stuck to my sock yeah, uh, yeah. Is, yeah. is kind of ridiculous um, but Cass also asked this question, which was, I'm doing my first school visit for a high school next month. Uh, so Cass landed a, uh, if I remember correctly, it's a two book graphic novel deal uh, that was auctioned um, and is going out there and starting to do sort of school visits and things of the sort and says, do we have any advice for me or the kiddos? Uh, is there any like tips for, for those that are doing school visits, <laughs> those who are getting into this? Are there things that uh, you would recommend? Oh, oh gosh, um, I've never, I've never done visit. No, I, I take that back. I think I've done middle school a long, long time ago. Um, I think you know, maybe less so with the, with. It's definitely it's so much about the age range, right? Like if you sit down on the floor with preschoolers it is not the same present preschoolers are so tough um yeah. <laughs> it's not the same presentation like i'll break it up k through two and then three to five and my actually my presentation is very similar from k through five, five or even six but like if they're separate i can kind of like talk through things in a different way like i yeah. make a slide deck i tend to break things up for me it helps to like and i'll even tell the kids kids going into that because there's nothing worse than just being like here you're in an auditorium I don't know what's happening I like to tell them this is what we're gonna do I'm gonna talk about this that then we're gonna have questions then I'm gonna draw first we're gonna read but like I kind of like let them know what's gonna happen so you at least yeah they're aren't not like you have no agency whatsoever because we're just asking you to sit there and be quiet um, Try to work in some interaction, but like, man, I don't, I don't know with high schoolers, that might be, <laughs> that might be really, gonna... really tough. I mean, I have one high schooler at home now and like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they tune uh... out. Yeah. I, I mean, my, my really simple advice stuff that most, some of this should probably be pretty self-explanatory, but uh, I learned some the hard way and I've learned through other people is have multiple different ways to present so if you get there and they don't happen to have the right hookup for your cord oh yeah for your, yeah, yeah you know if you're yeah. bringing an ipad make sure that you have so i have a, a kit that essentially has all the different uh adapters that you need yeah and i learned that from jared krasoska where he had a little like pencil case and it wasn't pencils in it it was um like dong it was moles and HDMI. stuff and yeah adapters. It was all, the, all the things that you would ever need so if it ever became an issue um i also uh if for some reason, uh, I have problems like there's a battery issue or my iPad has problems. I also have it saved as a Google Drive or a Google Slide Deck. Yep. So I can pull it up if, if they just give me a laptop. Well, I'm still good to go. And so there's like, 
there's there's tricks that are are in that range um but I think the the I mean obviously practice time and all that kind of stuff but with high schoolers it is going to be different because there's probably going to be more about like professional career and what it's like to be a professional artist um versus like I'm going to read you a story yeah. Yeah. um but I, I do think that sort of over preparing is better uh knowing that there is going to be some hiccups at some time uh down yeah. the way the other one that i throw in is talk lots about what it was like for you when you were that age yeah uh, so like my i don't know about you but my slide deck for for doing school presentations has pictures of me when i was their age yep yep and it's same it, it's yeah it's just like hey i was once you and talking about how especially for little kids i don't i don't know about the high schoolers but for little kids a lot of times there's kids saying like uh, I don't know if you get this, but they'll be like, wow, you're so great. And it's not that, I mean, of course you would get that. That's a silly statement, but, uh, no, I, sh I it's not that I show terrible. Yeah. I was a terrible, like I show like the first drawing I did when I was three of my mom and it like, it's, it's embarrassing. It's terrible. But like, then I jump to the next page where like, I'm much better. <laughs> so you can see like, I wasn't very good at it, but I like to spend yeah. time in it. And it's, it's a time that matters because it, it's so true. It's not that I'm, I'm never lying to kids, but it really helps, I think, to see that, like, it's more about that you're interested in it and you like doing it and then you get better at it. That's what I was going to say. It's yeah. the same, same sentiment of uh, is to talk about how, you know, maybe you weren't as strong when you were younger, but now you're at a point where in practice, and you know because there's all those kids out there that you know they may not have an understanding of what illustration is versus uh sort of gallery work or things of the sort but they have a lot of hesitation or a lot of fear about uh are they good enough or is you know they see someone else's work and think it's better and just to tell them that it's you know time and patience and practice is really what it comes down to it takes a lot of weight off their shoulders at at any given point yeah um uh then i also saw a question uh from uh, illustrated who tunes in and he had the question which was as seasoned professionals which uh i will not take claim to that of any sort uh <laughs> is there anything you still struggle with um is there anything i still struggle with <laughs> i think i think the struggle comes more with the writing okay um for illustrating. Is is the writing just because you weren't naturally trained as a writer? I think I think I just get something else? stuck at points where like, if I don't know what to do with the story, like if I'm at a real sticking, like I have stories that just linger for years because I don't really know how to fix them. Like I know yeah. there's something good there. Like I had a I had a good revelation the other day about one um, that I had been thinking about about it in terms of like who who the story was about it was two characters and i was like wait a minute i'm like maybe it's about the other character but why did it take me five years to like think about it like that like i was just stuck on rewriting the same beats of the story and being like i don't know i don't know if it's i want to make sure that it's good enough before i take it to a dummy stage because i've fully dummied up at least one story probably like three stories and then been like, no, I just spent a real long time drawing everything out. And it's just not. Yeah. yeah. Well, you you got to make sure the uh, the ingredients aren't bad before you make the Yeah. <laughs> but then, then on the other side, I get stuck on the writing part. So I'm like, I probably should jump to drawing some stuff sometimes. Because I think, I think I've learned through the years that like the stories that do best for me in the ends are the ones that like are more, have a more interesting char character. Like I've really like fleshed out what that character is like yeah um, character based which is what they always say anyways right but um i mean i i have that same thing where it's it's there's too many ideas not enough time uh yeah it's yeah a huge huge problem for me um and also i do have that like tendency and, and my wife can attest to it of when i have an idea i'm like oh i gotta really work on this and then i just get sidetracked or it doesn't it doesn't jump out at me as like something I got to do immediately. And then it sort of falls to the wayside. So the, it's, I have a lot of false starts. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think a lot of that is just, I didn't go through school to learn how to be a writer. And you asked me to start a piece of illustration or a piece of artwork. And 
I have no problem jumping into that. That's not ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, ask me to write something, and I'm going to him and haw for a long time before I ever get going. Um, is there, uh, on the illustration side, are there things that have been challenging for you or, um, you know, or are still uh, challenging that you deal with on a regular basis? This sounds so awful. I, don't, I can't think of anything that's, um, <laughs> Must I think, be nice. I think I've Must gotten nice. a lot better in the past couple of years of like, I think what, what my biggest problem for a long time, and it still is, is, is probably like being frozen, approaching something. Cause you're like, I, I can't see it. I can't see what it looks like. I've, I've been doing a lot of work for highlights the past couple of years. Last year it was like, easily half my work was highlights and it was like a lot of hidden picture stuff and like they'll throw it but it's been it's been really good for me in the sense that like I'm like okay it's an assignment I'm doing it but they'll throw like skateboarding cats cats at a skateboarding park and you're like uh how do I fit all that stuff in in this space and it's black and white like yeah so I'll I'll, I'll spend some time being like ah, I don't know if I can do that <laughs> but you have to do it so you just do it so that's been a really good lesson for me. And like, don't, don't like spend time being anxious about stuff. Like just go do it. Um, I, I probably beat myself up more about like not being um, an everyday sketchbook person. And I, I try to get back into that, that habit, <clears throat> you know, here and there. Cause I know it's so much better for you to like produce ideas is but especially if i've been busy on like an assignment based thing i'm like i, I don't know if i want to spend some extra time doing something i'm just you know yeah, yeah. but uh, it's a it's it's very hard in my opinion to turn your work into a fun thing if you're doing that work even if it's they have, they have that statement it's like if you uh if you do something you love you'll never work a day <laughs> in your life yeah. uh, which i think is, is is sort of silly because i love making artwork but it's still an absolute pain sometimes um and it's not that i'm not doing what i love but it's just sometimes you have to get through some of the tough stuff in order to get to a point where you're you know something excites yeah. you um yeah. one one thing art wise that i've always had a challenge with that um i think is uh, uh especially for someone and and i assume you sort of fall into this same ballpark of like we don't live in a world of realism with our yeah. artwork and yep. so, you know, if I were if I were in the world of realism and I needed to draw a horse, well, I'm going to go look at lighting on that horse. And this horse has this pattern on it. And the way that its nose is angled here, I need to draw it this way, et cetera. But when I live in the world that I do art wise, I end up falling into this um, this like, well, I draw noses this way and I draw eyes this way and uh, getting into traps where I'm sort of just following a pattern and not actually thinking about what's best for the piece. Um, and some of that is just, you know, time and patience. Like, do I have the time to sit there and worry about like, is this the right type of eyebrow for a character? And so I just fall back on like, well, this is the way I've always done it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I don't know if that's always the most healthy thing for a portfolio. Like you want consistency and you want something to be recognizable as yours. Um, but I also think that just because I live in this world of not necessarily realism, that I fall prey to symbols or icons too easily. Yeah. And yeah. it becomes sort of like, well, this is the answer to that problem and not, well, what truly is the problem that I need to solve? Um, or, you know, is there a different way to approach this every time? And it, so like one of the things that hits me and I don't know if, if anybody goes and looks at my portfolio, uh, <laughs> this is one that gets me every time and it, it still irks me to this day that I do this. Um, but if you go look, almost 99% of everybody is going to be looking to the right side of the page. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's, yeah. it's something about like having them look the other direction just doesn't feel comfortable to me. And there's no reason why I should be doing that. There's no, there's no like, well, no one ever looks to the left. Well, uh, but isn't it a page turn thing? Cause you're always turning. Well, some, some of it is, but even when I'm doing illustrations that don't have the page turn or even in a situation where it's like, uh, you know, a big group, environment you got to have some people look in the other direction yeah. and i almost yeah. always just use like pupils to solve that <laughs> and not the face and so, <laughs> so like i fall again it's that same thing like i fall into this trap of like i'm just used to drawing that 
side or uh, one of the challenges that I've had, and I don't know if you have the same thing, but like I have a harder time drawing female characters than I do male characters. And but, but girls have all the fun hairstyles. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> I find like, the opposite to be true because of that, because I'm always like, what hair am I going to get? <laughs> but see, here's my theory, though, is that I grew up looking in a mirror at myself and being influenced by resources like comic books where it's like a muscular man jaw. <laughs> and so like I fall prey to like tropes that line up with that more so than uh, like, I just don't know if I've done enough studying of cartoon versions or um, uh, sort of, again, that symbolism that goes along with like, here's a more uh, feminine jawline or here is something that is more, you know, non-binary or anything of the sort. And so I, when I draw characters, I always feel like I'm putting a wig on a guy. <laughs> and, and like, yes, there's more fun hairstyles, but like, you can only put so many bows on people's hairs uh, and, and things of the sort to say like, hey, get it? This is a little girl instead of uh, some boy that has a buzz cut every single time. Um, the, so again, I mean, the, the, the question and, and uh, I think is a, a very, very solid question in the sense of like, it sounds like both you and I still have issues or things that we struggle with. And it may not be the same thing that everybody else has. It may not be like, well, how do I compose the piece or who am I looking at yeah. or those things? But it's still, yeah. there's still like things that we all worry about uh, in, in these books. Oh, absolutely. Uh, like, is it is it good enough for the market? Like, is my style evolving or am I like stuck in a rut? Like, and I honestly, I feel, feel like the, the postcard thing has been so much, so much better for, for my growth because of that, because it's forced me to every month be like, okay, I want to do something. And it makes me look back a couple of people did some really cool posts where they posted like what what they did each month was of the of the previous year i'm like oh yeah. that's really cool to see like your progression and and what you accomplished in a year but yeah oh yeah there's like a million, million little things but i don't feel like there's like this one overarching yeah, overarching. yeah. other than just overarch like anxiety <laughs> like yeah. just just overthinking stuff and talking myself out of like fun ideas because of what i don't know same thing with stories do I, I do that with like the starts of a story and I'll just like abandon it and be like, I don't know if I should like put the whole effort into it or if there's something better. My, my huge problem, honestly, that's like totally unrelated is that I, you may not suffer from in the same way that I suffer, but how do I get my work that is painted traditionally or collaged or what have you to have the same color and vibrance <laughs> in a printed version? Um, that is, oh, yeah. uh, I, every time I just got, um, some proofs back for a book, uh, and it is, I mean, it's not outrageously off, but every time it's darker than, and it's like, I know that I'm, you know, it's my screen is going to be slightly different and whatnot, but I get as close as I can get, but no matter what, going from a essentially CMYK, uh, process to an RGB screen and then back to CMYK. Uh, things just get funky and I will probably fight that until the end of my time uh, on this here earth um, just because of the method of making what's what's RGB about it uh, just when I go to screen that I'm looking at a screen that presents oh uh, yeah even though you have a C you can set it to CMYK yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and so it's 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 literally just that transition of like uh, not that the file changes or anything of the sort, but looking on screen, you get a different effect of the glow of the colors. So I think my stuff looks so much better on Instagram and on screen, et cetera, but that's not how they, yeah. uh, so there, there's little things like that that are just like, yeah, you know, that's not something that I even have as much ability to shift. Like I can color correct my screen and stuff like that more, but in reality, every printer is going to be slightly different and I'm just going to have to adjust and learn to live with some of it as I go along. Um, are there, when, when you're illustrating, sort of thinking about the sort of holistic talk about style and, um, which I know is a dangerous word, um, but are there things that you see as like, and I, I asked this to everybody, so I'm not pinpointing you here, but, uh, things that are markers or, uh, 
ways that you describe your work or sort of view your work as being distinctly yours. And the reason I ask is not that um, people won't be able to see it in your work anyways, but how, what are you attending to in your work? I would love to pay somebody to do that for me because <laughs> it's so hard. Like, I feel like you use the same, like maybe I was describing it like five years ago as like, whimsical and colorful but i'm like I, I don't know if that's the right i feel like somebody could do a better job of describing my work for me than i could uh, unfortunately that's like not my strengths you know so, like, so, uh do you have anybody you could ask to do that uh uh yeah absolutely i was i was so lucky when i started with my trade work that i had a um shout out to my, my 2017 picture the book author and illustrator buddies but like we were a really good debut group and like we're still we still have our little facebook group going and we rely on each other when like something weird happens and you're like wait a minute like like we're talking about like networking and stuff like you absolutely have to have people you can ask so, so i'm gonna write that down so i don't forget it <laughs> I, can, I can do some sort of a trade -z. I just like I've had students all the time ask them to write artist statements and artist bios and there's always that hesitation of like well what do I write how do I talk about myself and even someone someone today asked me do I write it in the third person do I write it in the first person and uh, I eventually said that you can write it in the second person if you wanted to like I don't yeah. think there's that rule as long as you really are getting something someone else can write it for you as long as it sounds and is evocative and interesting i don't really care how people write it i had a student and i mentioned i had a student years ago that wrote their artist bio from the point of view of their cat <laughs> and saying like they don't spend enough time petting me <laughs> and uh, they're always making their artwork and blah, 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 like all these great little sentiments that in turn made a really fun uh artist statement or you know their bio or whatnot, and like, is that the standard protocol of so and so is a illustrator that works in this you know field, and like, it doesn't all have to fit that same protocol. And so like, using someone else and say like, write this thing for me. What would you say if you were me? Is totally fair game. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the there there's fun ways to do it, but I writing about your own work and talking about your own style I think is something that people should do more often um, if you are trying to discover yourself. That yeah. looking always isn't the best answer and actually taking the time to say, okay, well, I'm just going to write. Sometimes you'll find stuff in the writing that wouldn't naturally come out if you were trying to look at your artwork to solve all of it. Um, is there, uh, you know, like words that you use just so people know reference point? Are there things like I use the words that my agent at one point said, which was um, warmly off kilter for my work, Ooh. which, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice phrasing. Um, it has that off kilter, which makes it sound like, okay, there's something wrong with it. But the word warmly just all of a sudden turns it from being bad yeah. into a yeah. good thing. And I want to normally, like I was using the word naive before, oh. but I think warmly yeah. off kilter is a lot more appealing. But are there words and things that you use for your artwork to describe what you're doing? I mean, I think I could I could craft them better, but there, it usually has to be something about being humorous and heartfelt yeah. in there too. Because I feel like I always have that balance of like it's funny, but it's never like harmfully funny. There's always like a <laughs> huggy vibe to it, okay. you know? Like harmfully. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that entails, but yeah. Don't do harmful. Uh, the uh, have you uh, with with your agent? I forget who's the agent again. Uh, sh it's it's Sean McCarthy. McCarthy, yeah. that's right. Okay. Um, has he ever described your work to you? Um, I don't think so. I'm sure he describes it when he sends my work out to people. So I'll have to I'll have to ask him. It'd be interesting to find out. Like, like does he use different words? than what you would naturally use. Uh, oh, I'm there. sure, yeah. Is it horrible, not worth your time, those kind of words are uh, <laughs> I feel like something. You've given me a homework yeah. assignment, Mark. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Listen, I mean, that, isn't that what we do though? Yeah. It's like. 
I did, uh, yeah, unintentionally throw something at you to, to dive into. I, it was uh, last week afterwards, I felt really bad that I had uh, Dina Seaferlin on and we had a lovely time talking, but during the middle of it, she cried because we were talking about artists that, and teachers that have influenced us yeah. and like that were really important in our lives. And it just, it touched her in a way that was like, you know, talking about some of the people that made her sort of cry out of, uh, I'm assuming happiness and joy for that person. But it's the first time I made someone cry. And then I asked my wife, I was like, did I do something wrong? She's like, no, you're like Oprah. You got, you got them to, <laughs> to cry. So now I have a cry count. Uh, and I should have an assignment count too, where it's a, you just ask a question that prompts someone to go, oh no, I got to do that now. Um, are there, uh, Oh, wait a minute. Are you trying to get me to no. cry now? Is that what this is looking? No. Okay. But well, let's see. What, let's see if we can get there. Uh, <laughs> are there? I was. I. Uh, well, I won't even get into it. It's a long story. Um, but uh, are there artists and people in your life that were influential that you can sort of look back now and go like, "That's the person. That's the moment. That's the thing that they said. Whatever it may be, that started this whole thing." Um, that's a really tough one because I feel like I was always given like <clears throat> time and, and like materials to like create as a kid, but like, I did not get to meet like a professional artist until I went off to art school. Minus, minus my art teacher in high school, who was lovely and very supportive. We didn't have like some intense bond type thing, Yeah, but, um, I think it, it took me a long time to really, um, I, I think, I'm trying to think about college. College was so weird. It was so, it was just very overwhelming to me. Like, I really felt like a fish out of water. I'm so much of a late bloomer with everything in life. So I feel like, of course I've naturally, you know, it took me like 20 extra years to find what I wanted to do. Um, I think the the ladies that I, I talked about, Wendy and Amanda, when I worked for them, the animators in Harvard, yep. um, they were they were just so lovely. And like, I come from like a really chaotic um, animation studio. So it was nice to have like this, like this very, like I had a good boss type vibe, you know, like, oh, I can create and it doesn't have to be, you know, sleeping under your desk at some yep. point because, <laughs> you're there way too late and it's ridiculous. Um, it was so cool though, when I first started, like as, for as crazy as that workspace was, like working in Olive Jar was like fantastic. Like everybody was like young. Shout out if Laura is still on there. I know Laura was on there. Earlier. Oh, that's right. That's, um, is that where you met Laura Kazoo? Yes, Laura and I, I worked at Olive Jar and then we were roommates and friends. That's yeah. right. Oh, crazy oh, times, man, crazy yeah. times. Okay. <laughs> Sleeping in like the boss's like office, on a couch where there's like a I, I'm pretty sure I could remember like you're at the age where you're like did I remember that correct I'm pretty sure there was a dog that was in a cage there and it was the dog where like you didn't let the dog out of the cage because it would bite you and I'm like I'm so tired but I also don't feel comfortable sleeping with a dog that might bite me in this office <laughs> um yeah, yeah that was crazy just to see like what a cool thing because like I didn't grow up with like working artists or like anything like that to just see like people out there like doing stuff, you know, like yeah. living their life and being really creative. And that was just a, a huge, a huge eye opener. Um, and then I would, I would say the people that would probably make me cry are people that aren't with me anymore and really changed my trajectory on like putting more effort into getting where I wanted. Um, I worked with this lovely, I was talking to my daughter about it earlier, actually. Um, Hold on, I have to make this file folder name. It's driving me nuts. I can't, I can't talk and work at the same time. February. There we go. I do try to stay very organized. Yeah, you. Have, with digital files, I imagine you have to be, uh, and layers you don't and things. You don't have to be. <laughs> you can be as messy as you want to be. Well. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, anyways, when I used to work at. Um, what am, I, what am I missing? Um, water break. <clears throat> when I 
when I worked at the um, scrapbook and stationery company, I, I had the chance to actually hire and work with artists. And I met this lovely woman, um, Jacqueline Addison, and she was just such a boss. Like, I just, I met her at, at like one of those big, you know, go to the Javits Center and pick out art Wait. and pick who you're going to work with. When you say and boss, you mean like a badass boss. She Not was a, just like, so like, like us, uh, I would say most of those licensing, the, the women who were working in licensing it, at that time period, because I know things have changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. Like they are just so hardworking and so safe. They get their sales game on because you had to, right? Like you were just yep. selling yourself to people walking by um, and just saying yes to all these amazing opportunities. But Jackie, when I met her, she just, there was just something about her that was so like, I instantly liked her and felt comfortable with her. And she was such a joy to work with. And she always pushed me. Um, and it was just such a love, lovely, you know, relationship that we have. Um, she passed away, I think, I'm trying to think it's been, I think about 15 years since she passed away. Um, and it was a real, and, and we talked about it because she, she knew probably six months before she thought she had Parkinson's, but it was, it was something else. And, um, she, she was really the one that made me quit, not, not directly, but just like my experience with her and seeing her life and what she had accomplished and how forward she was and how take charge. Yeah. Um, she really motivated me to be like, you know what, you're going to get out of this office job and really focus more on, on what it is you want to be doing. Um, and I had some money saved up and I was going to do part time. And then it just ended up being like, I'm just going to go. And it was, you know, not, not the maybe best financial move, but like <laughs> it really, it really was the best move for, for me getting what I wanted in life, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah. she was, she was fantastic. She was like just a force and she's probably the first person. It took me a while to find that first person where I was like, yeah, that's, that's somebody who's who's doing it right i know that it's always sort of um in a way probably even more uh beneficial for um for people that see diversity and see people who are trailblazers when it comes to uh those sort of industries and things of the sort like at, at the school that i teach at the person that uh, started the illustration program um, was this this wonderful woman, uh, Alyssa Della Piano, who is still working as an illustrator and, and things of the sort. Um, but what was really interesting to me at one point, we had a conversation about what it was like when she first started out in her career. Um, and, you know, she was retiring at the time and we were talking about all these different things. And she told me about how uh, she used to be in a, in a illustration studio proper where it was, you know, they had in-house illustrators and things of the sort. And she was saying about how like people used to smack her on the butt and like the environment that she was in and to know that she sort of got to the other side where now she's in charge of a entire illustration pro or not even in charge of started an entire illustration program at a school and became a hero to a lot of students that uh, walked through those doors. And, you know, even to this day is still making work in retirement um, is, I imagine, even more rewarding. And so I could imagine even like when you say that the the, the badassery or the, the boss uh, <laughs> level that goes with some of those, um, the women that you worked with, I could imagine that some of that also is just like seeing someone like not put up with some of the patriarchy and the... Uh, the awfulness that has plagued so many different industries throughout the years. Yeah, I definitely have, you know, family members that had to deal with that just just a little bit ahead of me yeah. or so. And like when I started in, in animation, it was like, I think I was like, it was like two out of 40 kids in my class were female, you know, like, and, and it was like such a switch. I went to an all girls high school. So it was like, a total like flip and I was like all right I'm like this is like actually like more my environment like I, I yeah. got along better with with the guys than I did um in high school but um I don't think I I mean I did I definitely <laughs> I 
like, oh, you forget the things that are bad. I experienced a couple little things um, the first place that I worked, but like pretty, pretty minimal in, in the grand scheme of what women like your yeah. you know, person yeah. started your group are like. And I think that's part of it too, when you're like, oh, it could have been worse. You kind of yeah. minimize it, but like the idea of that still happening is like crazy. Just but. The, the history that is there and seeing people that were, you know, started their own company or especially in times where it was, it was even harder. Like when I hear about, uh, and, and students probably think this is crazy, but like when we started out and I assume it's the same for you, like my first sort of advertisement for my illustration stuff didn't have a website on it. It was just a phone number. It was a shot in the dark. It was a single image and you hope you get a job out of it. And you know, the, the, the resources and the, the, evolution of illustration has changed so much um and i look at it now and go like whoa so many antiquated things i did when i started out but i know that uh i had it in a way easy compared to people before me and you know they had it easy to the people before them um because the industry changes and things get you know things evolve essentially. yeah uh, let me see i see there's some some people have types and things so i want to make sure i get back to these um uh, bu, 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 uh, where was it? Uh, okay. Um, this is from Maggie Schaefer, who says, MaggieSchaefer.ig, uh, I've been given the opportunity to propose projects for a kindergarten and, gr uh, and grade one kids as an artist in residence visiting the school. Any advice or ideas for projects that are age appropriate? So don't get, don't give away your, your money makers, but for like young kids, when you go in and you do school visits or you do anything that works with them, are there things that you know just automatically pay off those kids are excited about? Um, well, a residency is, is different. I have my first residency coming up in March. Uh, um, so I can't give away my one program that I'm doing. Yeah. Where, where is it? Um, it is down in Massachusetts in Boxford. So I'll meet with... Um, first and second graders, I'm going to do a whole school-wide presentation to K through two, but then um, first and second, I'm going to get a chance to meet with them. I think it's only one time per group. That was sort of the challenging part of, um, I got to go back and read and think. I think, I, I forget if it's once or twice. I talked to them two, two years in a row about doing a program and it, it, it changed radically. So like my thinking about it had to change. So um things for kids kindergarten so little um and if it's end of the year kindergarten it's very different than yeah. start of the year kindergarten it's almost like first grade you don't want to do start of the year kindergarten because they're just like figuring out school yeah um they're still having to bring pants to change into and yeah. they have accidents yeah yeah um i would say test it out if you can whatever you come up with test it out out and have you done anything like that mark uh i'm trying to think if i've done i mean i've done like little sample drawings and stuff like that with with kids but for the most part not in the same exact way that's being described but i think the main thing is like simplify yeah i think the challenge that i've had is every time that i go into those situations i overdo it and so i have this big elaborate plan and this goes for any sort of teaching I have a bigger plan than what actually makes sense for the time. Alone. Yeah. And some of that is I'm just a talker. Some of that is I, I really did not understand the interest level or um, the time that was given to me or the resources that are in front of me. And so I would keep whatever you're doing simple. Um, yeah, absolutely. I would say mod model something for the kids first, give them expectations so they know what's happening. Right. Yeah. And then keep it simple, but like whatever's really fun for that group, you know, if it's like a superhero thing or a monster thing or an animal thing, like narrow it down. Probably like a character, a character creation would be fun at that age, depending yeah. on how much time you have. Um, I mean, even, even just a how to draw something. Yeah. Um, I found is, is super effective for that age group of just like, okay, here's a character that I'm going to do. Like, even when I've done stuff with students, um, where it's like, I'm going to draw something, you're going to follow along. 
and I say like, you can make up whatever you want. Yeah. They all follow whatever. You want. And it's yeah, not, yeah. It's not that they are uh, uninspired to do their own thing. I think it's more so just school itself. They've been told what to do for a lot of time, uh, and then yeah. all of a sudden you, you come in and say like, you have freedom, and they don't know what to do. So it's easier for them to sort of track along with with a pre existing project, and that's okay. I don't think there's any harm in in just saying, okay, well, you know, if you want to follow along with this. Um, one of the things that I've had that has worked out really well with, uh, one of the books, one of the books I worked on was the penny book. Um, and they, the company made this thing that's actually really great, which is just, it's as simple as a circle on a page that says like they branded it. So it matches everything. And they just said, make your own coin. And it's about sort of a lucky penny of sorts. Yeah, so yeah. And just that like simple prompt of like make your own money is not complex. There's no big, like you have to follow this, how to draw this specific character or do this thing of the sort. Um, and some of the kids obviously just did a drawing of what I had in my yeah. book, but a lot of them were like silly uh, jokes that they had said in class or uh, other really fun things <laughs> that, you know, I want naturally say like, Hey, that's what I, what you should draw. But um, I think those are the things where like just a simple circle. It's, it's like a Peter Reynolds uh, book, yep. The Dot, yep. right? It's like just a simple dot and like, what can it be? And that's all you really need for a project for some of those. Yeah. As long as you have some examples and you do some wild things to show them how far they can go with it. That's yeah, it. you got you got to model it for the kids who are a little more reserved yeah. and then like celebrate whatever comes out of it, you know? Yeah. I mean, kindergarten art is my favorite art in the world. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, like, I would go to a gallery show any day that was kindergarten art over a fine art, like, museum without any concerns because I, the way that kids think is yeah. so, so good. Did you see the, there was someone made a, uh, some teacher made a post that was about, um, I think it was, like, some craft paper thing with preschoolers where they had to make a horse's mane. Have you seen this one where it's like the, she put them in order of like something that looks the most like a horse. And then she started showing the pictures of the ones that got crazier and crazier. <laughs> that the kids no, did. And like, that like, eventually the mane is like on the face and eventually there is no horse anymore. It's just hair. And I think it was like <laughs> yarn and everything that was there. And it's just like the, the idea of like how wild it can get with that age group, because some of them are really going to follow rules and the other ones are just going to not care of any sort. And it was so fun to see these kids wild interpretations of, uh, of a very simple prompt. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, okay. So here's another question for us from Dory doodles, uh, CL. When you are photographing your work, uh, what type of camera do you use? And that's a whole nother loaded question that we'll talk about, but, could you point us to any resources that can help with standard book sizes, set up uh, pages with bleed, binding considerations, et cetera? So I'll answer the first one because I'm guessing the first one doesn't really hit you as hard as it does me. No. Nope. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't even photograph stuff. I have a scanner. Um, I am a person who believes in scans over photographs um, just because of the resolution and quality you can get out of it. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about is the sun in the way? Uh, do I have the light set up the right way? Um, all of that is, is easily taken care of for me. Um, but uh, to answer the question about, uh, and so resource for you, I prefer, and I've said it on here before, so anybody that's heard this before, you're with this, but a uh, Epson Perfection V600. Uh, it is a small eight and a half by 11 scanner. It's not anything that's wild or, or crazy uh, in its capabilities. Um, but, uh, it's decent price for what you get out of it. It's a high quality scan. I never suggest people get a scanner that is a, uh, multi-tool like printer, scanner, faxer, uh, copier, whatever. I don't even know why faxer would be in there anymore. Um, that get a single use thing. It's going to be higher quality. Um, and is yours, is yours the oversized flatbed scan or is it like a letter size? Letter size. <laughs> So you so, stitch them together? Yeah, I mean, honestly, just Photoshop and automate uh, photo merge. And it does a pretty awesome job. The only time where it would really struggle is if you have black and white artwork. That's where it would have a hard time. 
um, but for the most part, it, it does a fantastic job of getting all the uh, the nuances uh, and and lines it up and it takes two seconds you might have to make like six scans but once you get that done it i just don't have to buy a you know two thousand dollar scanner yeah. which yeah. is uh, a nightmare uh for a for a startup cost of something and if that breaks that's even more challenging a smaller scanner that you know if it breaks in in my case i'm not horrified by it yeah it, so. yeah um but let's go to the to the the later half of that question, which is, could you point us to any resources that could help with standard book sizes, setting up pages with bleed, binding considerations, etc. And this is this is probably a tricky question, I assume, or at least I see it as a tricky question. But um, do you have resources that talk of any sort about standard sizes? Um, I mean, if I'm given an illustration job with sizes, you know, when I'm just illustrating you just you follow along with a template whatever you've been given yeah. um, when I'm putting together books um, I think it surprises people like I had my my first editor call with um, with my new picture book editor yesterday and it was like the big question was trim size yep. because I don't think a lot of people think of like when you're creating when you're an author and illustrator and actually a lot of times when you're the illustrator of a picture book for trade that you have some input about the size of the book and there's not a lot of standards yep. um i mean it can't be 22 inches big but like you know is it square is it landscape is it you know wide like what is it tall and there's kind of sort of some basics but like you can just go to the the library and look around or a bookstore probably is better and like see what some sort of standard sizes and like what suits the story so like the one that i'm i'm doing next it's square and I, I had built it. So I, I build, when I'm doing my dummies, I pretty quickly jump into InDesign because I'm comfortable with that program. And I'll build my, my PDF there um, and play with stuff. And I had built that dummy at nine by nine just for like whatever random reason I built it. it didn't matter. I just knew I wanted it square because it suited the story and the action that was happening. And we talked about it yesterday. And I was like, well, I'm like, I, my, first book small is nine by nine. And I'm like, well, like that's a little bit on the smaller side because um, it suited the story, but this other story is a very big character. I'm like, can we do like 10 by 10? You know, like. Um, <laughs> I like the, the big leap in scale. I know, it's a whole, a whole inch. Character. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but then thankfully I'll be able to step out of that process and it, it, I will get, the designer is gonna put together a template so the things like, like bleed, um, it's mostly bleed and just knowing like not to run stuff into the gutter. Yeah. Um, somebody else is watching out for me. If you're doing self-publishing, then that's a lot more on your, on yeah. your plate in terms of figuring those things out and maybe like what requirements, depending on who you're publishing it with has, like maybe there's standards you fit and you can pick up a template from that. The, I, uh... the big question, I'm not sure if I've answered it, but. No, it's, it's, I think you're spot on. Like I have some publishers that I've worked with where I ask them and they have a very distinct size that they want just because they feel like it would be cool at this size. You know, just thinking about like the bookshelf and how it sits on the bookshelf. Yeah. Going to a really wild proportion is probably not the best idea just because librarians hate it. Uh, booksellers hate it when you have something that's like, you know, 12 inches tall and four inches wide. Like that's not a, a great size because it doesn't fit on a standard bookshelf. Um, but um, I have one of the publishers I worked with a lot. Uh, they have two sizes. They're the same. Oh wow! They're the same proportion, but it's it's one's horizontal and one's vertical, and it just makes their e process easier. They don't, you know, the the printer they work with is um, has a little bit more of a limited capacity in what they can do. Um, and so you just work with some of those two and it makes it easy for me because I never have to go and say, okay, what's the trim size? They just sent me a thing on the first book that said, we only do these two sizes, pick and choose what you want. <laughs> um, I tend to, when I'm doing my own dummy books, I tend to go relatively square because most publishers can handle a square. And yeah. even if say it's nine by nine and they want to make it 10 by 10, like it's pretty easy to scale stuff up when you go to the finished artwork. Uh, yeah. and, and same thing, like as long as it's a proportion that is manageable 
And one of the things I would suggest is just rather than worrying about uh, like, what is the best size? Literally go out to a bookstore and pick up some books. Yeah. And go, Let me. Yeah. And my guess is you'll find some pretty consistent sizes. It may be off by a quarter inch here or a half inch there, but you're probably going to end up with a, a, a very distinct range to play with. Um, what about, uh, oh, I will say this, pages with bleed, binding considerations, et cetera. Um, I do the same thing of, I don't use InDesign to start, I use Photoshop and I create a layer that's a, a template layer that has my bleed uh, applied to it. For those that don't know, uh, we're talking about this and people may not know the, the terminology if they're new to it, but uh, bleed is the, when they print an image, they cut off the edge. So if your yeah. image goes all the way to the edge, there is not a little like mistake of white that the miss, you know, if they miss cut of any sort by any fraction of an inch, it doesn't have that. So you actually paint the image beyond the bleed line and they trim it away down to the trim size. Um, and so I set up a, a layer in Photoshop and then just bring that over. I use Procreate for sketching the books and I just have that layer on all the time. And I, you know, it has the gutter, it has all that kind of stuff. And then when I get to the bind edge for the, um, uh, for the book itself, that's when I need to check and make sure, like, do they have any re different requirements? Because sometimes they add a bigger bleed or they might have a distinct size or a setup that they want the type on the bind edge that you have to match. Um, but for the most part, it's ask them. Uh, and, yeah. and just don't go too wild in, a, in an odd direction without some sense of it, like being effective for the story. So if you decide you want to do something that's like a, uh, 10 inches tall and four inches wide and it's about skyscrapers. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that makes sense. Um, but again, always consider that making the book and having it look cool is not always the end result that it has to be on a bookshelf somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> that's always a, a challenge. I even, I don't know about you. I built bookshelves in my studio here with my, my dad came to help me. He's more of a, uh, woodworking person. He helped me build them. And there was lots of consideration of like how tall do these bookshelves have to be. And I have books that I have that would not even fit on the shelf that I still have to turn sideways, yeah. even though I purposely tried to make the shelves big. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other considerations there. I don't, I don't think there's anything else that we need to touch on with that. Uh, someone asked what my scissors are. These are the best scissors in the world. These are Fisker, uh, what are they called? Fisker shears. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. But I love these scissors because it's not finger based. It's it's your palm, so it's so much easier on the hand. Yeah, those are big though. Oh, you mean scale wise? Yeah, when I do collage, I have. I'm trying to think where my my good pair of scissors is. It's like it's real tiny. But I think because I just work, I work tiny. <laughs> yeah, you know why I do this though. There's a specific reason why I like these big scissors because I could use like exacto blades and other things. Yeah. To get stuff. It's I can't get details with this, and part of my aesthetic is, or my approach to my aesthetic is um, not being able to, or to make really interesting shapes. And so rather than using an X-Acto blade where I can get, you know, if I get out my, my, my actual like X-Acto blade and get in there, I could do all sorts of detail work, but because I'm using a little bit clunkier scissors and they're big, I can't get the little tiny details. And so it adds to some of the clunkiness yeah. intentionally. So there, there is a, it's not a- uh, Well, I mean, and you, have, you go back back and you paint too don't you uh yeah i do some painting i do some sketching and stuff back on top of it so i can clean up that way if it really comes down yeah um let's see uh so I'm, oh vita has the same scanner yep <laughs> it's uh i'm going through here uh uh don't yeah <laughs> josh monk word says so don't tell your publisher 10 4 uh is that what i'm hearing yeah uh i really i mean you can ask a publisher for galleys that's, I don't know if everybody knows, do you, do you do that with your, with your work or do you just sort of make it up as you go? For galleys, I usually get like, you mean proofs? Mm -mm. The galley meaning the, um, the type layout for the pages. Oh. Before you even start the artwork, sometimes they'll give you like, this is the paragraph size. This is where the type's going to be. We want it to be placed in this general area. Um, I, well, I think it goes through that with sketches. So it's all laid out in a template. Um, I, I'm actually, I wonder if he'll do that because they're going to, he's 
going to scale it up from nine by nine to 10 by 10 for me and then send it back. And then it gets routed around for edits yeah. or art edits. But I wonder if he'll drop the type in. I, um, cause I, because I'm doing a full dummy, I, I, you know, put the type in myself. So, oh, I think it, and it's, so it's in there for sketches. So if there's an issue size wise, it gets dealt with then. I, so I ask them sometimes to put in, uh, or to give me galleys primarily just so I know what font size and scale. Yeah. They're using. And then, uh, I make sure to check with them, like, is that the final placement that you want? And most of the time yeah. they say, move it around wherever you want. Um, it's not tied to that location. Um, and that is helpful. And so, and I ask them, like, can I split apart a paragraph if it makes sense for, like, the pacing? So it's like, you know, if there's a sentence that should be emphasized, can I separate that on the page or does it need to be tied to the, to the text itself? And almost everybody says, like, go have fun with it. Um, but yeah. I find it really helpful to have a type block to work with. Uh, and then I use that as a layer in Photoshop where I, um, I actually like can map out the best spot for the type to fit knowing scale and like, do I leave enough space for the type and all those, those odds and ends. Um, I just, I just find it super advantageous. And every time that I can, I'm asking for that going forward because I think it just is so much more helpful for me long term. Um, the, are there are there things that you do uh you know obviously for those that are interested in self-publishing it may not be the exact same thing but are there things that you do uh in prepping story wise like when you're doing the storyboarding and you're doing the um the or, or the dummy book are there certain things that you do to make the job easier for yourself as far as like do you do lots of thumbnails or do you work larger scale because you're digital what's the What's the setup on that? that um, yeah, I try, I try to go simple, simple to not so simple, but I try not to go even, I think I've learned, like if somebody shares a dummy that's like really tight, I go, ooh, it just makes me like yeah. cringe because you know you have changes ahead of you. And it's at that stage of like selling a story, it's more about like, are you conveying the idea and do you have, have a couple of good finishes in there to, to kind of carry the rest of it? um yeah i definitely do thumbnails and they're like they're pretty ugly where's my little <laughs> go drag my my thumbnails out my, my school visit bag let's see Do you have do you have like the sketches in there that you share with students? Oh yeah, yeah. These are my in there. I'm gonna stand up and see where I am. Oh, I gotta put another. I'm bright enough here. My screen's bright, but my oh, it's pretty bright on my end. There's my thumb. There's so my yeah, thumbnail. You, and those are tiny. I mean, those are there's that's why they're called thumbnails. Is there's the yes. size of your thumb. <laughs> the size of your thumb so this is from small and it's like you know that story you can see it's like this is an old version so there's some different stuff but it's like pretty pretty basic i feel like that one with the bike is as complicated as it gets city so i'll scan those in and then i'll i'll, I'll redraw a little bit tighter yeah and then Let's see. Is there? Here's a too you, much. You, like, not enough up, for me. Yeah, when you go tighter and you start to do that, is is are you scaling up in scale in the the size that you're working, or is it? Um, uh, I think yeah, I think I probably up the size. Obviously, not not at thumb size anymore. This is probably true to size, and it's like half the size of the book, or yeah. maybe a third the size of the book. Um. And that's like, honestly, as deep, I mean, this is pretty detailed or pretty, pretty tight, I would say for me, for a dummy. I think I've loosened up quite a bit since yeah. this. Um, I will. Well, I, you. Hold on. well, even, 
like one of the things that I'm I'm wondering about and uh, is is I don't actually do thumbnails and maybe my uh, <laughs> maybe it's a bad idea that I don't do thumbnails but um, I am definitely someone who I like to just sketch directly at scale and um, you know start out loose and then refine it on top of it but i'm also doing digital and so i find it easier like i just start digital with with the idea building so i can just copy and paste and for me uh the refinement comes from like just going back and cleaning up lines i have the same i almost have a a, a very similar problem in the sense of um i am too tight and i'm trying to learn to be yeah looser. and yeah the whole reason and anybody that's questioning like why would you want to be looser don't you want to be a tight and refined with your uh sketches i find that i end up getting stuck and uh feeling like i've defined the illustration too much in the process at an early yeah. stage and then it's not fun or inviting for me to work on uh later down the line and so that <laughs> that idea of it relatively loose and and sort of um playful in that sketch stage is important to me and i'm actively having to loosen up as i go along yeah yeah it's hard with books too because like you're married to it for for months you know like you want to you want to be happy with what you're you're spending all that time on and if you like commit too much to the sketches sometimes you don't feel like you can you can wiggle around this i feel like this is a lot tighter than i would normally go but i also feel like some of the characters Characters like just having a tiger as a main character makes it you gotta get in like 20 details to show that it's a tiger. Yeah, that type of thing. Gotta have enough stripes. Um, gotta <laughs> get the stripes in there and you have to, and yeah, yeah. In order to make sure it doesn't look like just a cat, that in order to be a tiger, there are specific things that have to be done for that. Book. Yeah, yeah. But then, like you know, the books on the shelf. I'm not spending a lot of time. It's just a couple of little scrappy lines. Yeah. Whatever, whatever that needs to be for that. But. Um, and how long do you, for, for reference sake, for those that are interested, um, how long do you spend doing thumbs versus refining versus, I mean, you already said like the length of time for a book yeah. is sort of that like uh two to three months and i'm assuming that's sort of the finished art that's just finished art yeah. yeah how much how much time are you actually putting into those sketches and the um the the roughs of if sorts? it's a picture book it's like maybe you know a couple days to go through a really rough pass it's a lot of going back and forth for me i feel like at thumbnails of making sure okay. like it feels like it everything fits right and then maybe close to a week to go through and do some tighter sketches but not not a ton of time i've learned to like like the, those even green books like i used to go, go so there'd be like 30 to 40 illustrations per book in those and i would go through and do you know, you know sketch a and do thumbnail tighter tighter like so i i do kind of a similar thing when i'm working on those types of books too even though they're grayscale, I'll still go through like really rough, a little bit tighter, a little, a little bit tighter, and then, you know, move, move along to the next one. And then I learned, I was like, you know what? I'm like, I kind of just want to go through the whole book, like re real ugly, rough start to finish. So I, st I started doing that. And I think that was, that was really helpful for me to feel like I could look at, look at it big picture. Yeah. Um, um, it also makes you feel really, really good like you've accomplished something you're like yeah i got through the book and you're like oh but it looks like yeah. it's just circles and lines <laughs> i get to go back and do it again. Yeah. yeah um i yeah i mean i i it sounds again i think like there's there's a lot of similarities in sort of the way that we approach it like i will go through and do the entire book uh and then sort of go back and refine where where i really struggle is um not necessarily in the like sketching out an individual page but thinking about how that page is in relationship to all the other pages that are there yeah, yeah. okay yeah. if i'm going vignette on this one then i definitely don't want to do a vignette on the yeah. next page 
and if I do a vignette on the next page, um, it better be something that's very specific and I can't use the same layout because that's repetitive. Yeah. And it's a lot of that, that balancing act of like trying to figure out the, the consistency and the surprise factor yep. on a book and making sure that you're, you're, you know, you're making sure that the page turns correctly, et cetera. And some of that, you know, is initial pass. Sometimes it works. A lot of times it's the second or third pass because you're trying to, uh, sort of think about the book as a, a totality and not just that individual spread. And sometimes that initial thumb pass or the, you know, in my case, the initial sketch pass, it's just like, okay, what's the idea of this page? Yeah. Uh, should it be a, uh, uh, a vignette or a full bleed or things of the sort? And then all of a sudden you realize like, wow, well, I've done three spreads in a row and that's <laughs> yeah. not a that situation yeah. for a product. Um, I, I, I mean, that's one of those advice factors where I don't know if you have the same sentiment, but like spread every page is not always the best thing in my mind. No, 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 not at all. I feel like that's, that kind of, I feel like is where like my, my animation background comes in. I don't know if you feel similarly about it. Like it feels like you're storyboarding a movie yeah. and you wouldn't want to watch, we do all love Wes Anderson, but you wouldn't want to watch the same shot over and over again, right? Like yep. you want those like dramatic close up moments where like emotions are hot and you want like an establishing shot of your scene. Um, and color does a lot too. I don't know if I'll, I'll open it up again and I'll, I'll make it small so you can't <laughs> see. Um, so I'll go through and I'll do one of these. Is this up here? Yeah. So this is the whole book and I'm just starting to rough in the color story for it. So even, yeah. even when you have pages that are like, it's a spot, it's a spot, separate, separate illustrations on each page, but like the white background versus this colored background, like that kind of gives it a little bit more fun and a little bit more movement through the story. Whereas if I have like over here, I'm going to have to fix this, this two, two pages where there's no background. I feel like that's kind of, and even down here, it might, I might end up doing something clouds or something behind and maybe not even a full color, but just something, um, that, you know, does a lot for the story too. And these three in a row, I'm going to have to do something. Cause that's a little, a little too samey. Me. And I don't know if that's going to be a dynamic color. Like maybe this is because this is a big moment. The sky's not blue. Maybe everything gets kind of wonky there for a minute to break those three up. But like just seeing your book all spread out like that is really helpful. There's one thing that's in there that is distinctly you in my mind. This, right? Uh, I, it's, I'm waiting for a delay here. Hold on a second. Which one are you pointing at? The first one? No. Oh, the yellow background this one here. yes it's that yeah. yellow is very distinctly you in my mind and it's is that a favorite color of yours um it has become i don't really think it happened until too much not enough okay. but like i painted the back of my studio door yellow i have a favorite yellow scarf like it's definitely some, somebody i forget who it was told me years ago about like your style isn't just like in your work, it's in everything, right? Yeah. Like your, your illustration style is also reflected in like your home and in your clothing. And maybe I didn't pay as much attention to that before somebody told me that. So it's the power of influence, but like, yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that, right? Like I do feel like I have a really strong <clears throat> sense of color. I, f I think I just followed somebody on Instagram today too, that I was like, wow, they have a, really strong like they always use this blue you know like yep. there's definitely that jumps out to me a lot more than character design for, for some reason like i feel like you can get away with changing other parts of your style but if your signature colors are there i don't know it's that color in particular what what always like i will i will associate that color with you and it's a very distinct like warm uh yellow it's it's you know, like there's there's mustard yellow and things, and it's yeah. not just lemon yellow. There is something that's extremely warm and inviting about the color there. And I think that, um, you know, uh, not that like, oh, you can only have that yellow 
ever again or anything of the sort but um it is sort of to me if i saw that yellow in someone's piece i go oh that's a gina yellow yeah <laughs> and there's there's nothing wrong with that of any sort um it's it's i have like you know some of the stuff that i do ends up being sort of the same palette primarily because i'm working with two a paint or or thing yeah. where it's like i just don't have the option to do uh extremely wild variations in color after i'm limited by what i have for options you know like yellows i only have like three different yellows so there it is um but to me that that's uh i look at that and i'm just like oh that's that is gina to a t um let's see there's questions well, here uh now I'm going to have to make yellow in this piece, too. I was thinking as I was working on this, I don't even know, my like off. Um, I was just trying to finish off one just for the fun of it. But I was in, in my head, I don't know if it'll work out, but I was thinking to do like different types of pink. Okay. I think I had like a girl moment where I was like, well, there's like magenta and there's mauve and there's like each <laughs> poodle is like a different pink was my thinking of that. But I am. Um... And maybe her streaks in her hair too i don't know we'll we'll see what happens I, I like the idea of yellow partially because there's this like this statue of a uh or the idea of like oh wait no this one's changed wait i'm looking at it now well there, it is still the dog sitting up there but i was thinking of like the the oh the poodle statue yeah, yeah the regalness of some of those things like pe purple and yellow is a a royal colors yeah yeah, yeah. and sort of yeah. that would would also work in a situation there um uh what was i gonna say uh andy andy wrote and said that uh his his illustration style is not reflected in the interior of his house but the outside i bet you it is and from what i've seen of of andy at some points working um for those that don't know uh aj smith on here is uh andy smith who is also an illustrator um uh fabulous illustrator in fact i've had him on gavin doodle here um uh there is a, a crispness to his work that I bet you shows up a lot more than he even knows uh, that, that is in a lot of the things. Um, the, uh, uh, there's another question here. This one's more of, um, <laughs> this one's a you question. Uh, can, this is from Leanne Markle, it looks like. Uh, can I ask what kind of tablet do you use in programs when working digital? I'm struggling with the work, uh, when I work traditional and digital with, wait, no, struggling with, I'm assuming my work traditional and digital with Procreate, but thinking of getting a tablet to work with Photoshop. So what are we working on there? You're on a Cintiq? I am on a Wacom Cintiq and it's on the older side. So I'm glad that it's still working okay for me. But um, yes, I have tried the ipad procreate setup and i just didn't care for it i use um it's got, it's got dog hair on it um i use the felt nibs on the stylus yeah so the the wacom screen has a little bit more um, grit to it than an apple um, ipad yep so between the marker felt and the screen it feels more like paper to me because when i was first and honestly because i used to work with tablets not the ones that you can draw on but the you know distorted Influence. you're looking at your screen yeah. um i did that for years using illustrator and i just i absolutely hated it and part of it was the texture and part of it is that disconnect so once you can touch here but i don't know it's just the slipperiness of the ipad I, i've tried a couple of cases i people love it i'm like an anomaly people just love <laughs> their ipad and it really just wasn't my jam i mean they have but, um, green protectors you can put on that make them feel like paper and whatnot yeah um, i'm sure if i gave it another call and i did actually sketch one one book out years ago because like i had to be on the go with my kids and i was doing it and it was fine but like um yeah, not preferred most people love it not for me um and i just use photoshop i think i'm just like too stuck in the mud every once in a while i try something else and it just i think i think i've just been using it too long um it's not going to go out of style ever. I mean, well, at some point, if they start charging too much for the subscription. It's very expensive. Yeah, yeah that's that's sort of a, a big negative there. But um, but yeah, there's the uh, so much there's so many options. My my daughter, who's who's 12, will pick up. It's like something about like, you know, while you have that 
freshness to software. You're not like antiquated and stuck to it. It's amazing to watch her like she'll use Procreate and then he'll, she'll use Ibis and then she'll use something else. And, and she just picks it up so fast. Wait, wait a second. What is Ibis? <laughs> I, I, Ibis paint? It's on, a, it's on an iPad. I bet if I asked her, she's using something different now, but yeah. she liked that one for a long time. I mean, I have students all the time that are trying to get away from, from Photoshop just because of the, the subscription cost. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think there's uh, any problem with them trying to get away from that. Um, but uh, I do uh, think that, you know, whatever it is, you need to be able to pump out something that is a layered PSD file yeah just because the industry still uses uh that as a standard yeah until that changes uh, it's worth sort of maintaining um uh what was i gonna say i i actually am one of the people that loves the sort of glassy texture of uh, oh yeah of the ipad but i know a lot of people that really oppose it um i've just never had a problem with it i think it's because when i first got the ipad i got one of the first uh, generations of it yeah and it was not um they didn't have all the options at that time so i just got used to the glass and didn't worry as much about the texture but um you know same same for me i started out on an intuos or or whatever it was early wacom to the point where in uh it was you know uh you weren't looking at this or you weren't drawing on the screen and the screen the cintiq scared me uh, I mentioned on one of these before I was talking to someone, they had the same concern of like, doesn't your hand get in the way? And now I draw on the iPad and it's not an issue of any sort. Um, but there was a lot of concerns of just like, how do you do it where you're actually drawing on the screen? And doesn't that hurt the screen? And uh, now it seems so antiquated to even talk about it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a learning curve either way. Like I, I was painting in gouache and then scanning it and then adding in line work um i would i would draw on tra tracing paper and then merge the, the two of them in photoshop uh, um i don't know if that it, it made any sense so yeah. I, <laughs> I would like i would draw the outlines on tracing paper and then merge them in photoshop and layer them actually the same way that i'm doing the layering with this with outlines now um but I got like three book contracts at once, kind of within short order. And I was like, whoa, I don't have any space. My kids are little. I only have like two hours to work when they're at preschool. Like, how am I going to make this work with paints and stuff? Like, it just it just felt like, all right, I think this is the time to make the jump. And I really didn't think I'd love it. But I, I went over... Um, Shout out to Robert Squire, who's in our group as yeah. well. And I was like, Robert, can I like try out your Cintiq and see what it's like? Because I just you had to like get to try it. And yeah, within yeah. like yeah. five minutes of using it, even though like it was like, OK, like align it to your hand and all that. Um, I was like, no, I, I, I can do this. <laughs> like this feels this feels much better than I thought it would. And so much of it was that disconnect of working, looking up at a screen and drawing down versus actually drawing on the screen. Yeah, um. it's it's uh, I think ultimately, I don't even think it matters like what you use as long as you're comfortable yeah. with it. <laughs> and, you know, that that can be something even more antiquated. I know I know illustrators that still use a mouse to illustrate with. Now, they're not doing like Photoshop. They're probably doing Illustrator. Yeah, the sort. that's a little bit more sort of like uh, not necessarily always vector based, but something that's a little bit more graphic. Um, but, you know, if that's what gets you there. That's that's OK. Um, I I use Photoshop, but I when I use Photoshop, like I have a Intuos tablet upstairs and I use it every once in a while. The only reason why I really use it for the most part now, <laughs> now that uh, the Apple um, iPad and Procreate and everything is there. The only reason why I really use that uh, Intuos tablet is not because I want to use it. It's because my mouse needs to charge uh, yeah. I need something else. And so it's like, well, I have that there. And I struggle with it, even though I spent years, I mean, just years working with one of those Wacoms. Um, Andy made the comment, which is really funny. I love this uh, saying that students all say Wacom and Wacom and Wacom, uh, et cetera. The only reason why I say Wacom versus Wacom, 
or no, I say, I say, yeah, yeah. Uh, We're all mixed up well, and it's 10 o'clock, but you can say what it is. No, I was at, I was, was at CTS, not CTS, what was it? Uh, CES, no, SC, I forget what it was, a big tech conference. CES, yeah. Yeah, CES. Yeah. And, and um, okay. there was uh, a person from the company there that pronounced it that way. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to trust that person. Oh, like the proper yeah. way to pronounce yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Like, I heard it from the horse's mouth of sorts. Now, it could be an employee that's trying to screw with people, but a Wacom. That's what it, That's what he said, not a Wacom. Yeah, it's Wacom. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know what? It's it's the, the GIF GIF. Uh, yeah. I'm st I'm sticking with GIF. Yep. My son, my son, uh, we were talking about today, he even knew. He's only, you know, 10 years old and he knew that argument. Uh, oh, yeah. And, of course, he said his argument was like, well, the guy who created it said that it's called this. I'm like, yeah, well, that guy's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what that guy says. You can't just change the way it's pronounced and expect us to go along with it. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, Illustration. Oh, next week. And he says, next week I start teaching the honors illustration with an iPad. Uh, uh, wait, what? Honors illustration. Oh, that's the name of a class? Wow. <laughs> uh, that is a clunky name. Um, now, uh, I know that, that um, you have helped out with uh, the school that I teach at doing portfolio reviews and other things like that. Um, have you done any sort of class teaching? And I mean, you said that the, one of the things that sort of inspired you to jump into uh, sort of the kidlet realm was having some of these classes with people, et cetera. Um, how much of that has sort of, have you returned the favor? <laughs> I, I have definitely returned the favor in small ways in a million times. I, yeah. I'm, I try to be very <laughs> open and helpful. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I love school visits because you're in and out and I love um, I really do like drawing workshops with kids yeah um, and I'd be open to doing it with with adults too but like I don't know about building a whole curriculum <laughs> it seems it seems like I would I would do that but I, I don't know I, I do really like the um, the workshops with kids are so, are so fun um, and not not intimidating and it's so great if like the adults sit and draw with them too but um, no, it comes up every once in a while because there's like an opening and like a mad dash to fill something. But yeah, um, I don't know. I, it's kind of like what, what you were saying about you're saying something earlier about like, oh, maybe self-publishing. Like if I'm doing that, then I'm not making books, you know, like yeah. there's only yeah. there's only so much time. If at some point in my life there's more time for one thing and less for another, then that's not I know, pulling I it probably, out forever. I have probably even asked you at some point like hey do you ever have any interest in doing this uh, and you're like sick and you need somebody to sub for a week <laughs> give me a call i'll, I'll yeah. be there that's fine but not uh yeah you don't want to you don't want to have to build syllabi that's uh that's probably it, yeah. that's probably all it is. but part of it is like i didn't go to school for illustration too so i'm like that kind of feels a little I know that doesn't make any sense in the reality of like, okay, well, you're doing the work, but I, I don't know if I would. I get it. I mean, it's the same thing of like, I've taught graphic design classes and I've taught animation classes and whatnot. And it's like, I wasn't properly trained in that stuff. I sort of learned on the fly. And there's always this question in the back of my head of like, well, are they going to see through the ruse that, <laughs> that I'm putting in front of them? Um, but most of the time they have no clue. Uh, one of the things, and I, it's not a problem anymore, but I, when I was starting out, someone told me uh, with teaching that you just have to be a day ahead of the students. <laughs> and, and you can learn the program a day ahead. And as long as you're ahead of them in that manner, you're good. Um, and so, uh, especially on the tech side, that becomes challenging. Yeah. Um, now, thinking about sort of uh, the, the digital realm, because it is outside of my... Um, outside of my wheelhouse uh, for the most part, uh, are there certain considerations that you have to deal with when it comes to uh, the publishing industry as far as like expectations on you? You know, like I always read the documents. Sometimes I'll get publishers that send me a document that says, hey, if you're sending in paperwork, it needs to have these, it needs to meet these requirements. Or not paperwork, if you're sending 
in uh, uh, traditional media that needs to have these requirements, like it needs to be scanned at this level or what have you. Um, are there things that you have to worry about just because it's digital or is it pretty much straightforward, you just send it off? Um, I feel like it's pretty straightforward. I, I kind of love that unless you're like, you know, I'm sure lots of people make that mistake where you're like, oh no, it's the wrong size. What do I do? Like, and honestly, I've, I've heard that through the years many times, but like, Oh, like the um, wrong guy or something. Well, like, like you've painted it at the wrong size and then like, you're just, True. you know, I don't know if you're cloning it to fix it or something like just triple check, check your sizes and yeah. don't like, Maybe once in a while I've started to build off a sketch and be like, oh, it's 150 DPI. Let me go fix that and repaint everything. Um, no, I'm kind of a stickler for details. I mean, I guess, no, I think it's, it's all just like general stuff that's like, there's lots of pitfalls. Yeah. Um, but the digital stuff isn't, unless it's like a, a deadline, there's a lot of like, you know, depending on how you're sending files, if there's problems sending the file, and you're like, but I finished the work and I was ready to send it, and then everything like computer crash froze up, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, but you're so used to this like in instantaneous, I can just send it right now because I'm done with it. Like, you don't have to plan any time to get it to the post office. That would make me so nervous. Have oh. you ever mailed your art? Um, I, I have not mailed uh, originals, but I did when I first started out. It was the era of zip drives. Oh, yeah. And, you know, email capacity could not hold a giant digital file. And so I've, I've sent that, but not, not originals. Now, for gallery work and stuff like that, I have, I have definitely sent stuff. I mean, I just sent stuff. Yeah. Uh, or my wife dropped it off for me at the post office yesterday. Um, and that's always a little scary. She was asked, she called me up and said like, what, how much insurance do you want on this? And yeah. It's like, well, um, in fact, I think Bill Illustrated is, uh, watching tonight and he bought a piece off of me and I sent nice. it the post office, bent it in half. Oh, even though it was in cardboard no. and stuff to oh. it up, they bent it in half, which is awful. Uh, and so oh, there's I'm always sorry. a risk. Um, but, uh, for the most part, I have not sent stuff. But I also, when I started out, uh, or when I was in school, we had CF Payne come and uh, show us. He had just gotten some work back from a publisher, and um, it came back. It was illustration board, but it came back with just the surface. And he talked to us about how, like, drum scanners. At yes. The time, they how they their, heal it off. Yeah, they right? peel it off, which Ugh. was standard practice. And it sounds so scary, but. Uh, you can, I mean, it's actually really easy to do and it's, it's not super hard to, to, or it's, it's not easy to mess it up. Let's put it that way. Just the way that the illustration board is designed. This is a weird history lesson for people. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, like I'm working on the illustration board here. The idea was they didn't have scanners that were flat. They had big giant drum scanners and they had to put it in this, you know, a giant drum in order to scan it, a big cylinder. And so illustration board, it's just the top surface that's really the high quality paper. Everything else underneath is a substrate. And so they would have someone that would take a blade, and I won't do it to this right now, but they would take a blade and they would get underneath the best part of the illustration and they would peel the entire top surface off so they could curve it in the drum scanner. Uh, and so when you got your illustration back in the mail, it would just be the top layer with the paint on it which sounds super scary, but again, you just, you can adhere it down to something else and you're fine. But CF Payne brought that in and it just showed us like, you know, how he added a huge, a huge uh, border around the edge for safety for mailing and all sorts of variables uh, to make it, uh, I wanna say more palatable, but that's not the right word, uh, to make it safer for the long term, to make the, sure that the, uh, the work was gonna survive. And so I learned a lot of like, Oh, this is how you make your work safe. And even like um, I used to, when I was in school, I would always have plastic bags, giant plastic bags that I would save so I could walk down to my classes with my artwork in a something that rain couldn't get to it. You know, like just little stupid things like that to make sure there was safety involved because not all things are safe out there in the environments. 
Do you, did you ever have to send originals? Um, I think I've always scanned. So when I had traditional work, I just had to scan it. And man, the stitching software was not very good when no. I was first using it. Actually, I don't even know if there was stitching software then. You just had to stitch it and that's what made it so easy for me to switch to digital. It was just going through a couple of books like that. It was just miserable. Yeah, no, the, the stitching software that that's out there now like does it for you. But I remember having to like take two scans and you had to sit there and like drop the transparency on one try to line it up the best you could <laughs> yeah. and then go in yep. and blend in between to try to get it as close as possible to perfectly lined up and it never was and then you had to go in there and like tweak things it's there it was such a nightmare to have to deal yeah. with the basis but yeah nowadays kids don't know how tough it was they're uh they got it so easy um but it was a it was a process what what sort of uh oh wait my my wife just said i remember when i got my back my illustration board piece from the printer i was a little horrified i don't know if they did the same thing lauren uh to yours but uh the the idea you, you mentioned earlier like uh going out and getting your work printed early on etc it made me think of this story and i show students it um when i first graduated i went and got um some illustrations that I had done printed at a really nice print place. I went to uh, uh, Charette. Yep. And there was one in Harvard yep. Square that had a print shop in the back of it. And I went there and I got this $40 print of this spread for a dummy book, like a finished artwork for a dummy book pit Ugh, that I had yeah. done. And I had spent this all this money to get this giant print. <laughs> and I look back at it years later and what it was it's just people didn't have the capability at the time. It was basically an 11 by 17 uh, laser print. <laughs> but at the time, because of what I needed and the scale and the color and making sure it was scanned and all this kind of stuff, because I didn't have a scanner that could do it, it cost me 40 bucks for them to do it. Yeah. And now I look at them like that would cost $2 at Staples and it wouldn't be an issue. But at the time it was like so, so... Uh, expensive to have those materials and the printers and maintain stuff that it just wasn't feasible yeah. uh, to get it done were there things that like when uh when you started out uh in the career illustration what have you that you look back now that feels so like rudimentary uh, um Well, I used to work in colored pencil and that was <laughs> okay. like, just what was I thinking? I, I had like this piece that I did. It was the first SCBWI event that I went to and it was a, um, a dinosaur, like a big T-Rex with like a Valentine's Day heart in its mouth, like stomping through flowers. And I made my very first first um, work connection that way because it was one of those events where they're like they're critiquing on what they see they've got like okay. a panel of like art directors and publishing people and it's anonymous and you're just sitting there waiting and one of the guys was like this person needs to come see me afterwards and I was like awesome like <laughs> I've, ne I've never had anything that good happen in like 20 more years of SWWI but but you know thank goodness it did because because that was my first client and I, I still work with them. I did work for them last year. Um, the way the way you set that up, I read it the wrong way because you said, oh, like uh, it was bad. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> I read it as that, like, you know, you have to see me after class. <laughs> yeah. sort of thing. And I was like, oh, no, what'd you do? And they're calling you to the teacher's desk. But, <laughs> like at the time he, you know, he and we, we made a connection. It was great. Like the first like sample thing I did for him, like it wasn't very good. But like when I look back at that piece, it took me 40 hours to make that one eight by 10 dinosaur. Yeah. And yeah. like, that is not feasible for education work like <laughs> at all. I think my first book jobs I got were like six weeks. Like they wanted them in less. I think I got offered like a five book deal. And it was like the time per book was like three weeks a book or something ridiculous. Um, how many pages per book? Sometimes educational books aren't as 
I think it was like a 24, a 24 page okay. book. It wasn't, it wasn't, I don't think it was 32, but it wasn't that short. Yeah. And like, I had to say no. Cause I mean, the, the pay was terrible too, but like, I was like, oh my God, like, I'm just going to be kicking myself for doing this. Um, and then like, you know, pretty quickly thereafter, another job came in, but I was like, oh my God. Okay. Six weeks. Like they've given me twice as much time. I should be okay with this. But like, you know, I had a full-time job too. So I was coming yeah. home at night and, and trying to do that. But like you very quickly realize like, okay. And at that point I was already working. I was already working in gouache. I did do a book for that first um, client, but it was, oh, it was like such a nice way to break into it. Cause it was an eight page kindergarten reader. Like, like what a great test of like, can I do a book, but it's just a baby yeah. book. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you're not, you're not over your head, but I was, was really stressed because I had a full-time job and I was doing color pencil and it took me forever. And I learned on that job, like, I think I need to just be brave and go try the brushes again. Like I painted in college, but I just hadn't tried it with illustration. I was just like clued to the pencil. So went, went for the gouache and it took me a while, but that's, what? you know, was the concern with the pencil just the amount of time put in or was it like the value of how much you're getting paid versus the time put in? It was the, t well, I think at that point, cause it was just like so thrilling to have work. Yeah. It was the, the t time and it was also worry about giving myself a repetitive stress injury. Okay. You know, like gripping a pencil and like, cause I was really burnishing with color pencils. Yeah. It yeah. was definitely, it would have headed towards that if I had tried to do multiple books that way. Um, but yeah, those, those deadlines can be, can be rough, <laughs> but it, it, te it teaches you to try to find like shortcuts or, or at least to really think about it. Like, okay, can I, it's, it's like sink or swim, right? Like, oh no, I spent like, like three days on this and now I only have five days left for the rest of the book. Like, what do I do? Like, I, I think it's probably pretty easy to get in over your head how starting you, out if you have a big project like that. So how do you manage your, like the expectations now as far as, cause like when you do start out, you take anything, yeah. you're like someone says, we need an illustration from Marlboro. Uh, we want to draw <laughs> fighter jet flying in over head and the marlboro man you know whatever and you're like is it pain and like it may not be your aesthetic but yeah. you're gonna do it um, yeah how do you manage now that you've been in the sort of world of illustration how do you manage that sort of like when to say yes when to say no uh, beyond beyond the like is this going to be fun to do yeah but also looking in looking to the like is it a feasible project are there are there criteria that you look for? Not as a, I don't um, like prices. I don't I don't think that's appropriate for people to share. No, on there, but. no, no. I think you you need to be definitely ask a friend like for people out there that are taking on like ask before you agree to anything. Okay. And like you know there's certain people out there who don't, don't pay people. They say they're going to pay you when the thing gets published and then it doesn't like. There's only a couple people like that, but like, you know, it hits everybody. I've yeah. done work for them. Everybody's done work for them. Um, but like ask around, cause like maybe you're okay with that. Maybe you're not, but like definitely check in with somebody who's got more experience if you can. And just, and people are so willing to help usually just like basic questions. It's like, is this person okay to work with? Yeah. Um, I think been... first and foremost is like knowing that it's a, it's a good client. They're going to pay you. <laughs> That's, I feel like that's that's a pretty big one um yeah, not gonna short change you or or i mean there are you always hear horror stories of that kind of stuff and i i think for the most part everybody is on the up and up um, yeah and yeah. and so i don't want I, I said that to my students today like i'm going to tell you a lot of horror stories of people who've you know seen their work being uh you know copyright infringement and all sorts of things like that and it's not to scare you but it's so you if it does happen to you you know how to deal with it um, because we've walked through it as a case study yeah. and, yeah. and, you know, there's a, there's a different mentality there that I want to make sure that, um, that they all understand that it's not all, uh, the world is not going to collapse on them because they're starting an industry that is, is, you know, challenging. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you better be prepared because you never know where your, your, that challenge is going to come from. 
Right. Yeah, I I knock on something, knock on my wooden desk over here. I haven't had any real horror stories, to yeah. be honest. And it did really feel like I heard so many. It just made me be vigilant about it. Um, and just, I think, I think that's half of it. I think that's half of it is just paying attention to be like, is this a scam? Is this a legitimate person? Does the time... <laughs> Does the time match up with my time that it takes me? Like, you have to be honest about stuff like yeah. that. Because it's so easy to want to take something because it's in front of you. But, like, sometimes you have to say no. And sometimes something pops up to fill it. Like, that person is, like, you can't you can't fib about it. Like, if you have a problem with the deadline, too, just tell somebody before it's, like, the deadline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Are you saying that you should communicate with people? That's a such a, like, it sounds so silly. But, like, I even had problems when I started out in Kidlet of, like, feeling like I couldn't ask questions. Yeah. But it would either somehow clue them into the fact that I have no idea what I'm doing or um, it was just, you know, time consuming for them. And, like, I don't want to bother them with this problem. Yeah. Uh, and I still have that problem today. Like, even with my agent, I'm a little bit hesitant to just, like, right, saying, like, hey, what do you think about this pro or, like, this idea? Um, because I worry that it's, you know, it's taking up valuable time that could be elsewhere. Yes. Um, now, agent, that's a different story um, because that is their job is to help you in those situations. Um, but uh, just actually, like, talking to someone is so silly that people are hesitant. And I think it's it boils down a little bit to that idea of, like, we as artists are a little bit reclusive. Uh, yeah. And to hole up and say, like, I'm not going to ask or challenge anybody of any sort because I don't want to be the problem child uh, that that causes those those issues. Um, I'm uh, slowly trying to put party hats on these uh, dinosaurs. Oh, it was I'm, upside down. I was like, what happened? I thought it was. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, I'm. I, it probably doesn't happen digitally, but as a. Uh, as a traditionalist, uh, I always spin the piece to get the best angle for whatever I'm trying to do, and it means that I'm constantly just the pieces twirling around. Uh, when I started out on Instagram, I did a lot of like uh, uh, what do you call them? Time lapses. If you watch, yep. them, they were just chaos. Especially when I was, <laughs> I was like trying to get the brush the right way, and it would just watch the thing. It would just be spinning for you know five minutes or however long that thing was. Um, I, uh, this is one of those, I don't know, watching you work here, it's interesting to see how fast you are. It's sort of like laying stuff in and, and getting sort of clean lines. Uh, and like you had your whole idea sort of mapped out before you go back to clean up. Whereas like, I, I didn't sketch the whole thing out and partially because I can't with the way yeah. that I'm working. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's interesting to watch sort of the speed. I noticed even when we started up this whole thing, uh, you had a entire uh, like character or two done before I had even gotten to putting down the background of what I was working on. Uh, and it was like the speed at which you work is fascinating to me. Well, I think you're cutting out paper too. I mean, when I'm doing collage stuff, it's it's the same. It's like you're you're physically you're physically limited, right? Yeah. Like you're cutting. I spend a lot, and I really like. I feel like that the when I do collage it kind of informs and balances out what i'm doing here you know like gives me a break from yeah from yeah. thinking of line and thinking more about shape um but i do i go much slower and i love that like when you can like move pieces around find the, the exact placement that you want for it yeah yeah i feel like it, it's it's a funner noodling process so are there are there different types of, like you know hearing that you do collage stuff on the side and, and so are there different um, mediums and things that you like to play with that not necessarily for the the professional side but are there certain things that like uh, if if you weren't doing digital work and you were just doing something for yourself are there mediums that you're like hey that's the thing I'd love to do um. um... I used to love printmaking. That was like my jam for a long time in school. That's like as as drawn out as you can get. Like either just like lino cut or like there's a lot of those 
there's there's stuff now that I'm like, ooh, like the the jelly prints have yes. done thing on those gel. I have not. That looks like yet. really interesting to me. Yeah. But like, I've not done it, but I'm excited to get my hands on one at some point. And uh, I even saw somewhere like the recipe to make your own yeah. gel because yeah. they they come like you can't buy giant sheets of it. So if you want to do a giant print on that, oh yeah, I think the biggest it comes is like an eight and a half by eleven, or that's what yep. I've heard. I think, like, I think you're right. There, yeah. there are recipes to make your own. So it's just like a ton of gelatin, basically, uh, yep. <laughs> to get you there. But like, I am, I am dying to do that at some point, just because of the textures. I'm like, I just want to get those textures. Uh, and I don't know what I would use it for. I don't know if it would enhance or do anything to my portfolio in general. But uh, well, you could make some pretty sweet collage papers with it. That's what I was looking at it for. Oh, I, just, yeah. I just haven't. Same thing. I just I'm like it's like twenty five bucks, and it's not like crazy. But like I'm like, oh, I should get one of those one of these days. But um, it is it is something that has been sort of in the back of my brain of like, do I want to do I want to venture down that road? I already have enough art supplies right now that I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I <laughs> if I want to uh eat away at the family finances for yep. <laughs> for that but at some point i will get my hands on one i was talking to a, a printmaking teacher and we were talking about like alternatives for students when they really needed to do some like work at home and things of the sort and they didn't have access to all the the print materials and i brought up the jelly prints and his reaction uh was humorous to me because it was a very like those aren't real prints and uh, I, I sort of challenged him a little bit on it. And I understand what he's saying. It's like, it's a different process and it's a little bit more of a sort of uh, like, it's almost like a potato print or a, uh, a very simplified version of some of the print process, like a monotype print that's out there. But like, it sure is cheap and easy for people to use. And it sure does seem like fun. Um, we should uh, at some point, if either of us uses one, we got to report in and say, this is what happened. Uh, <laughs> this is what went wrong. Uh, oh, my wife just said, yeah, I went hog wild and bought a ton of Posca uh, markers. Uh, oh, yeah. They're not that expensive. They're like four bucks a pop, something like that. But yeah, I bought a lot. And it was, it was because I just needed more palette. Yeah. I use them now yeah. and like, I just wanted other colors. Yeah, those are really cool. I've I've definitely played around. Like I took a long break of not doing anything traditional and then mostly because of um Beth's Introvert Drawing Club. Like that's all just sketchbooks and materials. And like my daughter had a lot of those um alcohol markers yep. that I hadn't really used before, like in any serious way. So I've played with those a little bit and those are really fun. And those um these everybody uses these these Caran d'Ache Neo Color. I think they're Neo Color too. They're yep. like waxy, but they're soft and they're water soluble. Those are really fun. Is there? I, I can't picture making like like I just think the like the professional side of me is like, how do I make final art this way? But I do like I I know it's important to like play and to just like not think about so i i love when i do that but then like where does it go <laughs> don't don't think yeah. about it too much so where does it go it's a uh it is a bit sort of like the digital i always i always worry about like yeah i have spent a lot of money on materials and whatnot but at the same time like i also as a uh this anybody ever wants to get into teaching this is the advantage i never have to pay for photoshop or any of those yeah pro I, the, yep. I get the whole, whole adobe suite everything they make for free <laughs> and so you know but if i had to pay for digital stuff like yeah that's a ton of money yeah to do that and like to maintain all the tech and constantly be updating it because you're using it so often and like i have a, a one of the people i work with uh is a very big photoshop uh person they do most of their work in photoshop and hundreds of layers and you know stuff that probably uh is not great for photoshop in general just because it taxes the program um and i've heard so many horror stories of you know things crashing and whatnot and like uh yes it cost me money for materials but i never have to worry about the power going out uh, yeah and in a file or now if the power goes out i have no way to see what i'm doing that's a whole nother issue but 
<laughs> <laughs> there, there's, uh, there are advantages and disadvantage material wise. Yeah. Um, or your computer just doesn't work one day. Yeah. Like that's... Yeah. It just decides that it, it's fighting against you. Um, yeah. So tell me a, a little bit about sort of outside of artwork and well, okay, no, I'm gonna ask this. This is a better way to, to jump into this question. Um, who are you looking at? Who are the artists that you're going like, this is the one, I think this person's amazing. Everybody should know who they are. Oh, let me get my bookshelf. <laughs> I hope I haven't swapped my bookshelf too much because I cleaned it a while ago. Um, I love Isabella Arsenal. She's sort of my forever favorite. Hold on, I've got books. I've got books. I've got a Mark book up here too. Let's see. Don't show it. All right. I have a ton in here, but. This was my Christmas book to myself. This is um, Jarvis. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you... okay. His work is amazing. I feel like I, I like certain people that like, there's elements of their work that I see in my work, but like you wouldn't mistake us at all. Um, Isabel Arsenal, I think she's just phenomenal. We got the chance to go see her, you and I up in Portland. Was that over the summer? Yep. Yep. Yeah, did not disappoint. She's amazing. Um, sort of in that, that same, well, not same, but I guess I, I always, I think I'm, I'm drawn to like a European sensibility with, with illustrators. This is uh, Delphine Durand. Was it ch the chicken? The chicken of the family. This is like one of my favorite picture books. Okay. It's basically my family dynamic. It's, three sisters and the littlest sister gets teased by the older two and they can they tell her that um she's a chicken and that she lays eggs every morning and they just take the eggs away and that's what they eat for breakfast and then they like they plant a feather in her room and they just really mess with her and then she just decides like screw it i'm gonna go live with the chickens um so but i just i love i love her illustration style it's just so her characters are so weird but lovely. I have a question and then mm. uh, and I'm making an assumption here. Were you the chicken? Oh yeah, I'm the littlest. Sorry, yeah. I didn't explain okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I figured it had to be something like that, that like your relationship to, the, to that is not just about like, oh, it's a fun story, but like this is you. This is your yes. life. Yes, yes. The youngest of three that gets teased. Okay. Um I don't think you can grow up in the 80s and not be affected by garbage pail kids. Sorry, inappropriate. They're inappropriate. They're always inappropriate. Wait, what is this? There's a oh, whole book of them? There's a whole book. <gasps> That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's it's all of like the first couple. Because I still I still have all of my garbage pail kids. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, man. I have like memories, serious memories of riding my buck up, book my bike up to the uh, the local gas station. Yeah, and just buying tons of those, and like now they're nowhere to be found. They were trashed so long ago. That's why I'm impressed that you still have them. Like, I still have them. My my parents are are savers, so like I didn't even think I realized. I was like, oh my god, we saved them. Um, they still. I don't want to like ruin the budget. I, I've restrained myself, but they do make, they've made a bunch of new series lately. I think there's like a literary one. So this one was like a um, classic horror movie one, Wolfman. I've gone off on a tangent, people that inspire me. Um, this is okay. <laughs> this is the stuff where it's like, for, for those that are, because one of the, my follow-up question is actually not who inspires you, but what else inspires uh, you besides oh, artists? Yeah. And so this is this is totally in line with what I was asking uh, or what I was going to ask next of sort of like knowing that this is something that was of interest to you. And, you know, it's funny because it is sort of the antithesis of what picture books are 
uh, because it's not meant to be uh, uh, cute and adorable yeah. for kids. It was, you know, kids bought them, but it was uh, a mess. <laughs> I don't it was know. It's kind of shocking that yeah. we were allowed. Like, I think at the first time I showed my kids, you know, it was years ago, but they were like, wait a minute, you bought these? I'm like, yep. I was like six and I'd walk down to the corner store with my, with yeah. my dollar and get like a pack of those, a pack of nerds. I was all set. <laughs> it's funny. You were it's funny because like my mom wouldn't let me read Mad Magazine. Every once in a while she, she'd crack and she'd let me get a copy because I loved Mad Magazine. But like it wasn't allowed and she wasn't super strict about stuff, but like no R movies, no bad magazine. But she let me buy the garbage pail kids. I should ask her if she really disliked them, but Did she, um, she also has like a yeah. dark like she likes horror and she likes darker humor type thing. So maybe she was like also amused by it. I don't know. That was she was like, This is the one pass I'll give. And she was secretly <laughs> that's why that's why your parents still had them. It was your your mom was secretly looking at them and you went and took them back <laughs> and she's probably horrified that you dare take your garbage girl kids back because that was her uh to go look at those like horror movie and uh the grotesqueness of those um i re those just bring back so many memories did they come with gum they came with gum um, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah i don't think i don't think they do now actually you know what maybe they didn't come with gum I feel like they did, but I just, that may be just because so many cards back then came with a stick of gum. They must have, because they were tops, but. And they were in a wax paper, right? Like a wax yeah, paper. Yeah, the, the, the new ones, they, st they still have the wax, the wax paper. The, uh, um, what? Middle, there, there are Garbage Pail Kids middle grade novels now? I just see it. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was going to ask you, have you seen the movie? The Garbage? Pale Kids movie? Yeah. No, that one just flew over my head. Okay. <laughs> this, I is this not, Lauren updating? I have not you? seen it personally. Um, it is. It's a movie that is known as a very bad movie. There's a podcast <laughs> you listen to that's it, called "How Does This Get Made?" and they make oh fun yeah 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 yeah, the movie yeah, yeah. And crash it. Um, that is one of the movies they did, and it's it's on our list of ones that we want to see at some point. Um, but. You should watch the trailer for it at least if you're a big Garbage Pail Kid fan. I don't know, man. <laughs> I got my limit. I'll watch the trailer. I'll watch the trailer. Yeah, I'm not saying go watch the whole movie, but you should watch the trailer just to see what it looks like because it might uh, might shock you. Imagine. Oh, uh, Mike Petrick. Do you know Mike Petrick at all? Mike Pet. Oh, Mike Petrick. Yeah. 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 He just he, he's he wrote R. L. Stein writes the Garbage Pail uh, Kids books. Oh, get which, out which makes sense, but um, that is uh, that is wild because I, to, it's just the idea of like taking something that felt so of a specific era and bringing it back like that just feels so weird to me. Um, the, uh, like when you said that, it immediate, immediately went, made me go back to like my sticker book. Yeah. Uh, it was filled with like lots of scratch and sniff or puff stickers. Yeah, like puffy ones, and like I don't know, do kids even have sticker books anymore? Is that a thing? No, I mean you put stickers on your devices, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and your water bottles. But did you have a sticker book? Oh yeah, I had sticker books, and my mom probably has them in the, in oh. the attic somewhere. Still, I have to look. I remember there was like a there was some weird store that was down the street that was like a like a discounty store it wasn't there very long but they had the oil stickers did you ever have the oil stickers where it was like like a puffy and you could like push down on the oil it would like move oh, around yeah. so it was like purpley and dark yeah. sort of goo liquid inside yes yeah. okay yes i didn't know what you meant by oil i thought you were gonna say like well there were exxon ones and there was mobile but, <laughs> uh, i don't know what, what you meant there but um i uh the, there were those and then um I forget there was one other type of sticker that I really, really loved that it's funny because a book, you just put them in a book. It seems so like yeah. very di distinct to that era. But um, I remember like when, when you bring those up, I can just like, it sends me back to like the craft store where you'd go and you can buy stickers by the foot. Oh yeah. 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 And you would go and yeah. you're like, this is going in my sticker book. I got to buy 12 of these. And then you go trade them with your friends. They're like, okay, I got some sticker of, you know, 
a robot that's dancing and I'll trade you that for this. And everybody built up their sticker books. Um, that's like, all I can think of is second grade. Yeah. That, that brings yeah. Back memories. It brings back like all sorts of stuff of like having a hamster and <laughs> like mm -hmm. stuff of that era. Wow. Okay. Um, I forget. Uh, I was on with David Litchfield a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about WWF and we were talking about like the, the world wrestling federation. Yeah. Uh, and we were talking about like how that was part of our childhood and garbage fell kids hit hard there for a second. Um, were there, were there other things that you were, um, there's a conversation going on about sticker books now. Uh, <laughs> were, were there other things that you were influenced by as a kid that you think are somehow like in uh, part of your work now? Um, like shows or, or. There was something that came up the other day that I put together that I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't remember what it was. I know the stuff that I that I loved that I was like drawn to, but were were you into My Little Pony? I mean, for a brief time, not not any longer than was was normal. I think. Then was um, I loved I loved playing with little cars when I was a kid. And those that's the one thing that I collect now. I'm kind of like I don't like the chaos, so they're like a small collectible. And you've probably seen me. There's my little collection. Yeah, I don't know what you mean by a little. Car. You mean like, like Matchbox cars? Uh, listen, sir, we're gonna get very specific. It's uh, Matchbox Lesney cars from um, England, from like mid seventies to mid eighties. It's pretty specific. This was the one that I had when I was a kid. So there. Okay. So this is the one I had when I was a kid. My dad um, um, was a truck. My dad was a truck driver, so I used to pretend like this was my dad going to work, like I'd play out in the dirt. Um, but then at some point I found a little antique store and I was like, look how dope this little car is. I want to go around town in this little car and it's metal and it's got the tinted glass. It's missing its little trailer, but I don't care because it's just so cool. Um, and then I put, put two and two together and I realized they're all from the same matchbox England made. Yeah. This, this one's got the little thing in the back. I I was definitely, I think because of my dad, uh, all three of us were very like car oriented and truck oriented kids. So At some did, point I'm going to figure out my car and truck book. I've got a couple of those cooking, but can't figure them out yet. But, um, but yeah, it's been cool to, to get those that like, those are in the, um, that first peanut and Mo book. Oh, all those yeah. I remember that. Cause you asked cars and trucks. Didn't you asked for like, cars and trucks that people i did yeah yeah so some of my friends like childhood cars are in there there's some um derby pinewood derby boy scout cars that are in there my sons and his friends um other friends their kids so like newer ish stuff but i was like i asked her i was like oh please don't send me things that are <laughs> don't aesthetically fit what i like but well, i, I remember, loved it. everything everything looked cool so i don't remember if i sent any i know i had some like I had some matchbook cars and it made me go back and look at them. Uh, we were at my mom's and she had saved some of those for my son to play with when he was there. Yeah. And we had um, matchbook cars that were uh, branded. So like we had a Marvel's The Thing car. Ooh. And some nice. other like really interesting sort of uh, like, you know, not, not like cool. Like I think there's a Spider-Man car, but it's not, uh, it's not like, classic cool spider-man it just said spider-man and it had webs on it but like definitely from the like early 80s if not 70s yeah uh, and it's vibe and whatnot and like they're pretty awesome and i probably should make sure that if those ever are going to leave her house they come back into my possession my mom uh, not my mom oh no that was uh oh freudian my wife <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was bad um my wife said, did you, were you a, a Barbie or a uh, Cabbage Patch kid? Yep. Bar Barbie, Cabbage Patch, had them both. I used to have like a little closet I'd play in with my Cabbage Patch dolls. It was like the linen closet at the bottom of it, but I could fit into it, you know. What, did <laughs> Take the towels out and let the kid put her, put her <laughs> Cabbage Patch dolls in there. It was great. Were there, were there ones that you have like memorized that you're like, oh, I remember so-and-so, like the specific names, or is it just 
a bunch of them and you just remember those in particular? Um, I had a preemie. His name was Maury. <laughs> I, don't remember. I, know, I can picture the other ones. I had a redhead. I had a blonde, but I don't remember their names. I just remember Maury, maybe because he was preemie. The, the fact he needed, that they had a thing for help. preemies is, I just don't know if that's okay or not. <laughs> Mind. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a weird, I mean, the whole idea of like, it's got his name stamped on the butt of all of those dolls is weird to begin yeah, with. Yeah, the branding, the tattooing and branding of the babies is yeah. a, little, a little odd. Um, yeah. I guarantee there's a lot of people out there right now that have that signature somewhere tattooed oh. on their butt. Oh, no, there's, there's got, that's terrible. There, there has to be. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, my wife, we were, what did we watch the other day that, oh, we were watching um, a show on Netflix and someone mentioned something about a, uh, a cutie mark. And I was like, what is a cutie mark? I don't understand what that is. And she explained to me that it was uh, on My Little Pony. Uh that they have oh, their, yeah, their yeah, yeah. on them. And there's like things that I didn't know just because I grew up with just a brother. And so we had lots of like classic boy toys. Yeah. Not a lot of other things. So even like the closest I ever got was probably like pound puppies. Yeah. Or pound puppies. Uh, which... Did you have, a, um, uh, what was the, the kid sister? Kid sister? Oh, my buddy and kid sister. My buddy. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we didn't, we didn't get it. I, I think, I was probably getting a lot of hand-me-downs from my brother. Yeah. Uh, or uh, I was trying to be cool like my brother. And so the toys that I would get would be uh, distinctly um, like robots and, and like, you know, transformers and stuff that were like, yeah, the, I'm yeah. like the age up or what have you. But um, man, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that I wish that I kept and held on to. I do have uh, some GoBots. Uh, oh yeah. Which is like the poor man's uh, uh, transformers, but I bet yeah, Lauren probably knows so much more about all of these things than I ever did. Someone said, "Did you have pet monster? My pet monster? Is that a? This is from uh, no, Dory Doodle." I, I'm too old for that. I I, I mean, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I think it missed me by a couple of a couple of years. I wonder if that's related to the kid's sister and stuff it sounds like you know it's pet monster pet monster uh, <laughs> it sounds like it's in that same sort of vein um did you have you shared any of those toys with your kids to be like hey you can play with these or are they all like hidden away and they're yours now yeah the big, big thing that got hand handed down and probably was like you, you can absolutely see it and and what i love is uh like sesame street loved ernie and bert loved love loved ernie and bert um and we had the Sesame Street Playhouse, which is like a plastic, you know, you can lift the top and there's a little, you know, slide on the side, a little elevator thing that has lasted through my kids, my niece and nephew who are in their 20s. Um, but it was mine originally. And it's still in like fantastic shape. Like it's, it's one of my favorite things that I have. And they, they definitely could play with that. Like didn't seem like it had lead in it. It was safe for them to play with. <laughs> Um, but they weren't really interested in the garbage pail kids. Like they looked at them, but they were like, "Those are weird." <laughs> yeah. well, moved on. Uh, I like like didn't have lead in it, and I'm like, even if it did have lead in it, it probably affected you so much that you wouldn't even know uh, that it had <laughs> lead in it. Like I don't know what lead is anymore. Um, the uh, I'm trying to think if there's like I don't think there's a lot of toys that I saved. Probably, primarily because my mom was one of those people that threw stuff away uh, yeah. fairly fairly quickly and easily. Um, but uh, I always worry that like if I get those things, when, when Charlie was really little, I would worry that I'd hand that stuff over and then it would just get destroyed. Yeah. Uh, all the yeah. But, um, okay, so outside of, outside of uh, those things, are there other things that are sort of influential or at least, oh, wait, I got I to gotta reference it because Andy just brought it up. Muscle wrestlers, yes. I don't know, you remember those at all? Muscle men wrestlers, and they were little. Were those like, the ones where you pulled their arms, like the no, rubbery guys? You're, you're thinking, uh, 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 Stretch Armstrong. No, but uh, weren't there little ones too? I, made, I don't know what the muscle made, guys are. Yeah. Oh, like M U S C L E, like it was like an, an ac acronym yeah. for something. And they came 
in a little trash can, which I never understood. <laughs> and they were pink. And you could, uh, they had a little wrestling ring you could buy. And they didn't do anything. They were just, I have one of those up in my old studio in this house, the craft room. Uh, and they were super weird. And eventually they came in different colors. I know that, but they started out pink. And if you melted them in the microwave, <laughs> oh, <green. laughs> we learned that one. Uh, there was a lot of with a good, product. like unsupervised microwaving that <laughs> I don't think the, the new, maybe some of the new kids get that, but like my kids, as soon as I see them, I'm like, what are you doing? What's going in there? <laughs> Yeah. Or like letting them microwave like a, a marshmallow because that's like oh, yeah. not too crazy and won't make the house smell. Look what happens when you put a marshmallow in there, like a um a Tootsie Roll. I uh, I remember to this day again, like these are bringing back memories of microwaving micro uh, muscle men. But then also it makes me think when I was uh, I remember when I was maybe seven. That's my guess, seven or eight. My brother used to sing the song, or no, I came to my brother and I said, there's this song, uh, I'm Popeye the Sailor Man, I live in a frying pan, turn up the gas and I'll say Popeye the Sailor Man. And for some reason, those two memories are tied together. But I remember that my brother, I sang that to him and he goes, I'm going to tell mom that. Yeah. that. And he made me do chores for him for a week. Yeah, uh, yeah, that sounds... Because I had said the word ass. That sounds familiar. <laughs> I like I that song will haunt me, the oh. haunt by the sailor because oh. of uh, I had to do all of his chores and uh, if I remember correctly, he, like ate my cereal. He was like, "I want your cereal," and I just yeah. have to cereal. I was afraid he was going to tell my parents. Uh. Um, this is uh, this is the part of the show where we we get out of artwork and we start talking about all these other things. Um, were you a were you a big Mister Rogers fan? Um, sure. I loved Mr. Rogers. It was in that whole Sesame Street mashup. He was just very sweet and chill. Reading Rainbow? I was definitely like a PBS kid. Okay. I think I slightly yeah. went over to Nickelodeon at some point. But um, I was not, a, I wasn't a Disney kid. I feel like, I don't know if I just was a couple of years off of that or it just really wasn't my jam. And like, even now, I'm like, my kids, my kids didn't get into Disney at all. Like, Really? Just no no appeal whatsoever. I'd be like, <laughs> it's like a running joke. I'm like, you sure you don't want to watch Ratatouille? Nobody ever wants to watch Ratatouille. My, I, was, uh, I was like, uh, Last Unicorn was maybe one of the first movies I saw in the theater. Um, Never Ending Story, Princess Bride. Oh, I can't get my daughter to watch Princess Bride. One of these days she will. Or she'll watch it on her own and then she'll come back and be like, you know what movie's great? Yeah, <laughs> we, have, we have like the Disney Plus and whatnot, and Charlie will watch some of the new, you know, Disney and Pixar and that kind of stuff. But then I'll be like, oh, you know what you should watch? We should watch like, you know, The Little Mermaid or things of that sort. Like yep. the, the sort of second coming of, of Disney, the sort of golden age of, of Disney or the second golden age, whatever you want to call it. And he's always just like, nah never has interest even like the marvel movies he hasn't seen a single marvel movie oh wow i have mentioned it to him many, many times like do you want to watch these and he has no interest but you ask him about naruto and he'll, he'll uh, talk to your girl oh yeah and so it's just it's the priorities issue there's yeah. so many options for kids though like we had like maybe two different directions we could go in as kids right and like now it's like look at all the things you just named that he could go in like what whatever's on netflix right like hilda my daughter loved hilda um the dark crystal when they redid that yeah. new series like she was like glued to that I, my son came downstairs the other night and he was like he was trying to describe something and he's like he was like it was this little guy and his eyes were glowing and he was sucking out his soul and i was like what are you talking about and it took us a while to figure out he was talking about dark crystal because he like popped in and out when we were watching it and it was the oh. uh, the Skeksis and the Gelfling, and it was like pulling out its essence. I, to be honest, I don't even remember that movie all that much. I mean, I remember the character design work and the puppetry and stuff, but the actual plot of that movie. The new one was was pretty good. The new one that came out a couple of years ago. Yeah. It was so much. I mean, you have a nostalgia if you watched it as a kid and you loved it. It's like a nostalgia thing, but then you rewatch it and you're like, it's okay, but it's a little slow. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> like everything back then, it's a little slow. 
Um, but the new one is like fantastic and it's still, it's still practical puppet work, which is super cool. I feel like I should get my son to watch Never Ending Story just to watch him when it uh, <laughs> goes <Hello>. down. <laughs> just to, just to, to horrify him when that, I mean, that is like a traumatic moment for, for kids across the country uh, when that yeah, happened. I saw people talking about that the other day and I'm like, yeah, I guess it was sad, but oh. like, I think I had already been like really burned by E.T. Yeah. E.T. was a rough e. one too. He was ter and I loved that movie. It didn't, it didn't change my love for it, but like the, sorry, I'm probably like, like off drawing off camera half the time, not looking. Is that um, but like, yeah, E.T., e. I loved that more than anything, but. Sad. It was also super traumatizing when, spoiler alert, there's a scene where E.T.'s kind of dead. Yeah. And it legitimately looks like he's dead, you know? Like, it's pretty realistic. Did, uh, did you, I assume you've seen, I forget what the kid's name is that's in that, Mikey or... Henry you know, Thomas, that's... the boy. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen his audition? Um, I think it, I did. Yeah, I think I watched like, this a while ago. Yeah, like shocking how good that kid was in that audition. Yeah, like serious tearjerker, and um, he put he puts on like the full waterworks, right? Yeah, like, oh yeah, gets, yeah. I remember that, like at the end of they're like, "Kid, you want the job?" Like they say it right there on the <laughs> audition. <laughs> Just so stupid good. Um, there, I feel like. You know, sadly, yes. Anything that I bring up from my childhood, Charlie is not going to be super excited about, uh, and I want him to be excited about it. But yeah. we will, uh, we will, we will get past it. Yeah, ET was a rough one. I'm trying to think. If there was uh, here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up. This is a, this is a tough one. That uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I. Am I gonna make you cry? Yeah. <laughs> no, there's only a few movies that have ever made me really cry. Uh, one of them was Finding Neverland, uh, and I don't remember why, oh, yeah. but I remember there being something sad in there that really made me tear up. Um, but the one that always shocks people is the movie Cocoon. Do you remember the movie Cocoon? Sure. We were pretty little when that came out. Yeah. No, what, it didn't make me cry when I was little. Oh. Okay. It made me cry when I was old. Well, yeah. It made me cry because it's like <laughs> grandfather, like going like, I want to leave, et cetera. And like thinking about my grandparents who had yeah know, were, were yeah. older at the time and like oh god that got that got me good yeah i was i was balling at that movie at one point um but yeah most of those like et makes me sad but I, it never got me to the tears that cocoon did which is like a steve gutenberg movie doing that to me is uh <laughs> you know, that's a real sign of a solid a solid movie if, if the gutenberg can do that um I don't. I don't even know how we got on. <laughs> oh, I just. <laughs> I just look at the comments, and Lauren say cocoon made her cry too. And I did not read it as cocoon at first. I read it as crocodile Dundee. <laughs> I was like, that's. I don't think I would admit that that one made you cry. Um, this is a. Uh, so, you were. Uh, I mean, you grew up in the eighties for the most part, correct? I did. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's a it's an era that will probably uh always be uh like i don't i guess every kid who's like someone grew up in the 70s was like the 70s was the thing um but i feel like the 80s had so much good wonderful stuff that we will never exactly get back to in the same way uh, no because there was less stuff so we were like all on the same page experiencing it like I re i'm I will admit my I'm old enough to have watched the Michael Jackson thriller video the night it came out with my family. And part of that's because like I think I was like the youngest kid because I was pretty little when that came out. But like I'm trying to think when that was was that like eighty three? No. No, I don't. Even... Oh, maybe eighty six. I don't know if it was that old. Now I'm gonna have to Google it because that's the time of night we're at. Um, <laughs> it's where it's 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 almost my bedtime and I have a random thought and I'm like, no, I need to know the answer. What year did Michael Jackson's Thriller? But like everybody watched that, right? Yeah. Like very few things that are everybody watched it, which is kind of a bummer now. Well, I was uh, listening to a podcast today and they talked about that exact thing that like um, they were talking about there's no one show 
that everybody sees. Like there yeah. used to be like you know, Seinfeld went off the air and it had the last episode. Everybody watched that show. Um, yep. And whether you were a big Seinfeld fan or not, you watch that show just because everybody's watching it. You needed something to talk about the next day at work. Um, and the same thing like with, with all those shows of, of our era. And you're right that like now it's just, you know, you're lucky if someone you're like, Hey, did you see this show? And they all go, what, what streaming service is it on? Oh, I don't have that one. Yeah. Have yeah. Instead, have you seen this? And nope. And it's just that back and forth conversation at this point. So wait, how did you look up ET yet? I or looked up ET. thriller and I was, thriller. my first instinct was correct. It was 1983. So I was seven years old go. when that came out. Okay. Yeah. So we're about the same age then I was yeah. up in that ballpark. Uh, Let's see. Uh, I'm I'm going back to some of these comments to see if I missed it. <laughs> uh, Mike Patrick says Wilford Brimley without a shirt on and cocoon was traumatized. <laughs> how dare you? Did you know how old yeah. he was in that movie? Yeah, uh, he's like younger than us when yeah. he's in that movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's yeah. horrifying. Um, Dory Doodles uh, CL says I love watching you both bring these illustrations to life. Such unique styles, but so much whimsy and playfulness. Uh, have you posted your other Instagram lives from the past that we can go back to view? Yes. So uh, anybody this, uh, Gina, you're going to be, not only are you going to be on Instagram for this, um, I'm starting to post them as well on YouTube. I did uh, see that today. Yeah. So I've had enough that's... people ask for it that it's just like, okay, I'll do it. It's a, it's an extra sure. step and it's, I don't want sure. to do, but it's, if people request it, I did it. Um, but some of them are on my, or not some of them, all of them are on my Instagram some of them now some of the, like the last few have started going up on youtube and i'm going to try to back uh go to the back catalog and see if i can put them up on youtube for people to watch nice. as well uh and that's uh if you go to studio hoffman on youtube you'll find them there um so you're you're gonna be part of that um the yeah mike petrick you're gonna end up on youtube at some point uh whether you want to be or not <laughs> um the uh what Speaking of, uh, you said you were late at night and it's the Google, uh, it's the time to look up random Google things. What is your work schedule like? Are you a, a, a nine to five person? Are you, do you work late at night? Uh, are you consistent in your work schedule? I can't believe I'm still awake. <laughs> really? Um, I mean, kind of, but no. Um, I kind of follow the kids' school hours for the most part, you know, like drive one kid to school, the other one goes on the bus, try to work, try to, I, I'm better about squeezing in exercise now, the luxury of being able to do that most of the time. It's important. Um, and then if I have to, I'll work later right. for stretches, but I feel like a couple of weeks of that and then it gets old for me, you know, like day really? plus night is... Does that mean deadlines or does that mean just yeah like if there's a deadline i need to push i'll yeah. definitely put in the hours but i don't like to do it for more than a couple weeks you know gotcha. um yeah i mean i'm trying i'm trying to do um morning pages again do you know what that is morning pages oh. so do you know that, that book the artist's way yes so i did that years and years ago where it's you know doing that is basically you know, it's a book with chapters and you kind of follow things, but there's, there's consistent things that are, are in there that you can carry forth whenever. One of them is morning pages, which is in theory, first thing you get up, you just write freehand three pages. You don't look back at it. Okay. It doesn't have to be about anything specific. It's just like free writing for whatever. Um, I don't do three pages. I don't do it first thing in the morning. As soon as like I'm back at my desk in the morning, I'll write probably like a page or two and it helps me kind of like because we live in a chaotic world where you can go in 50 different directions it kind of helps like give me some sort of structure that isn't too much of a commitment and helps me like like get ideas out about things I want to do sometimes like sometimes it's personal stuff and sometimes it's like I'll have like a book idea randomly that like pops up out of there but I think it's just a good practice um, and I'll pick it up and put it down since I started doing this, like maybe six months ago, I've put it down two times. Um, just when I feel like I'm not getting anything out of it. And then the new thing I added since, you know, it's a new year, you got to add something. Um, I'm trying to do write and then read. So 
whether it's a book, like a picture book or a chapter book or something that's hanging out, or um, I have that, um, this illustrator sketchbook book. Okay. Have you seen this? Uh, I'm waiting it's, for the It's so large. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, I haven't seen that. So it's, it's it's pretty beefy and it's really wide landscape, but it's is that a uh, Oliver Jeffers? Oliver Jeffers is on the, the cover, but it's okay. like every artist you could think of is in here, and it's there. Oh, like pages from their sketchbook. Pages from their sketchbook, and then there's like you know a couple of pages of about who they were and stuff. So I'll read like one or two artists or something in the morning just to like give myself some structure because I don't do well with a ton of structure, but I need a little bit. And then it really is just a mashup of whatever I, I have. If it's email -y stuff or sketchy stuff or putting together something for a school visit, what have you, that's it. You're pretty, you're pretty consistent on a daily basis. You're getting in the studio and making and yeah. yeah, yeah. I know. I thought about that one day a couple of weeks ago. I was like, I could just like lay on the TV, lay, lay on the couch, and just watch TV. <laughs> like, it just I think I've gotten to that age where, like, when my kids were little, it was so hard to find work time. Yeah. That then I got into that like super, super productive burst when I had time, and that's kind of dropped off. And I'm learning to like not be so like if I'm not producing, I'm <laughs> beating myself up about stuff. There's like an in between of that where I think you can like find that inspiration time, right? Yeah. Like yeah, that's the the healthy, the healthy median. That's the goal. Well, how about you? What's your what's uh, your schedule? Well, it depends on what time of the year it is. Right now, today was the first day of classes back, so I got up at stupid hours and drove in, and taught all day, and then came home, uh, and. Uh, so like today's a long day. Tomorrow's a recovery day. So I end up having a lot of those like. Oh, that's good. I got, I got to re recover. Yeah. Uh, for, especially during the school year. During the the summer and stuff, the the challenge is more so. I actually need the opposite. I need to actually probably be a little bit more regimented with my time because there's so many other random things I got to do that. Yeah. I I I lose track and then all of a sudden I've you know lost a day of just lots of random stuff but the teaching thing even during the summer and during breaks like we just wrapped up winter break but almost every day i was dealing with something for school even though it wasn't teaching just my role at the school requires lots of sort of uh check-ins and emailing back and forth and it's surprising how much that weighs in so getting in the studio um unless i have a major deadline i am generally I, I've tried to wrap, I try to make it so my weekends are weekends. Yeah. Um, I've been yeah. fairly good about that through the last couple of book projects and things of the sort. Um, but I, um, I definitely like when I hit the middle of a project, I am staying up later and working just to make sure I can meet, you know, schedules yeah. and whatnot or what needs to be done. Um, but um, I need more, more regimented on the writing side for sure. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah there's there's too many, many things too many random irregular things on my plate that it's hard to schedule uh a consistent time and just say like this time every day like even even with my work uh i'm going to schedule a, a weekly or or bi-weekly meeting uh for uh, the the division that i am the chair of and the problem is trying to find like if i say like okay wednesday afternoon at this time i'm available but then two weeks later i'm going to have meetings that people are throwing at me and i'm not available anymore and then all of a sudden it just becomes you know again problematic yeah. um uh what is so writing probably i know for me it like it ends up being oftentimes the last thing <laughs> yeah it doesn't it doesn't get prioritized yes um yeah, I was just I was asking my agent for notes back on a um a dummy that he has. Um because I like that would be more comfortable for me to like tinker with that versus like but there's 
there's no excuse. I have like like three other projects that like I just need to like take some time and work on it. I used to do um this is the first year I haven't done it in a really long time. Have you ever done um the picture book idea month that Tara Lazar does? Uh, no, I I I was thinking about doing it at some point. Um the again, it's one of those like just there's so many odds and ends that like being willing to devote time to something like that. Like yeah. I, the Inktober things, I do the Stinktober thing that I organize, but that's only once a week. And that's about as much as I can manage. Yeah. That's, uh, st that's still a lot because yeah. it's a month. Yeah. Those, those weekly or those daily things. I'm like, Ugh, and I know the wait. it's, what is it called? The thing again, it's the picture book idea month. So like abbreviated it's, Pibo Idmo, I think. I don't know how you say it, but um, it's, is it it's, still called that? Oh, well, I'm sorry. It's called Story Storm. You're that, right. Okay, that's that's. Yeah. I was like, there's a name. It's it used there. to uh, be in the fall. I think it used to be November, and that was really hard. And now January is like not much better, but it but it is. It it feels like okay, it's a clean start. This is the first year I haven't I haven't even tried tried very like I think I tried one day and then I I ditched it and I. And I often have like a couple days I'll lose it, but like there is something really helpful about it in the sense that like it just turns that, that part of your brain on to be like, okay, I'm not going to reject this part of my brain that's supposed to be thinking of fun ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have to commit to writing a whole book or anything. You're just jotting things down, just ideas. But often what happens is it kind of reawakens like the dummy that my agent has now I think I finally worked through last year during story storm because I kept like my brain kept being like, Oh, that would be a good idea for that story. And then I got off on a tangent and I finally like tackled it. So it kind of helps me with the older stuff too. Yeah. So I, I'm not so strict about like, it has to be a completely brand new idea. Like sometimes I'll revisit old ones and think like, what's a twist on it. Um, but it's really good for like, just like a daily sketchbook routine, right? Like a daily idea routine. Yeah, I, I need to like, I just need to have like a day where it's like, okay, this is a day that I reserve that I'm not doing anything else. And I'm going to focus on this. The The challenge for me right now is just finding a day that's consistent. And that is, you know, or, or a day that I can rely on. And that's very hard. Although admittedly Thursday nights, I'm like, okay, let's get a doodle. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been consistent with that. Um, but there's part of me that doesn't want to give up my night times. Like, yeah. That yeah. Separation of um, separation of sort of uh, jobs or priorities. And I would love to have uh, my night time sort of free if I can do it. Um, and, and some of that comes from the idea that like when I first uh, or for the last few books, I have done a lot of like late nights and especially when i first started out it was sort of like weekends and i don't want to do i don't yeah. want to give up family time yep. or relaxation time to yep. every moment being artwork um yep. i mean i don't know about you but like i've done this long enough now that i'm my my restful or the thing that i want to do to relax is is uh not necessarily artwork anymore uh it's, yeah. it's almost like get away from artwork because especially with the teaching side of things, it's like all day is dealing with how do you talk about artwork and come up with ideas with people. And then when I get home, it's like, sometimes it's not the thing I want to deal with of any sort. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think like going back to where we started earlier, talking about like creating from a sense of joy, like you, you can't do that when you're tired and you're just yeah. craving like hanging out with your kid or, watching a movie like you got to be happy right like i mean i don't know if i'm craving hanging out with my kid uh <laughs> i mean you've met him he's a pretty uh, fantastic kid yeah. no he's cool minus minus tonight when he was scratching his butt and trying to put his hand on my face that, <laughs> that wasn't the best what? thing in the world haven't but... seen charlie in a while how old is he now he's 10 he's 10 yeah yeah well there you go yeah but no he's he's pretty cool he's uh he's he's still like he's at that age where like he still thinks some of the things that we think are cool are cool so like we'll play like beastie boys and he knows the lyrics to beastie boys yeah, um, yeah. but he's also now it's like he wants to listen to minecraft 
songs yeah. and we're like, ugh, he's yeah. getting yeah. his own thing. Um, <laughs> and I don't particularly want to listen to those all day long. Um, but uh, he's still pretty rad. And he's uh, the thing that's like fascinating me now is he's gotten into um, Rubik's Cubes and uh, not just Rubik's Cubes, but all these other variables. And like, he can actually solve those things and like be able to see things in those puzzles that I've never been able to. And I'm a yeah. visual person, but like, he's like, oh, it's just an algorithm. All you gotta do is this. Oh my God. Like he is, he is the, he's gonna be the smart one out of all of us. <laughs> Somehow some, like, I've skipped a generation. And he's gonna get it. And we're gonna be the weird old artsy folks that are going like, I can barely survive on my, on my, uh, you know, retirement, and he's going to be <laughs> tra traipsing around with money out the wazoo because he knows how to deal with math. <laughs> um, uh, do you, uh, I, I don't even remember off the top of my head, but uh, are the are the kiddos uh, on your end into uh, art of any sort? Um, um, Piper is just amazingly talented, and even from the time she was teeny tiny, she had to draw every day. Like, had. To do we had like one of those little boogie boards that you like just erase oh yeah so it's not real like it's just a, a little screen and she'd sleep with that because otherwise she'd be drawing all over she was a, a drawer on surfaces that weren't supposed to be drawn on yep. um <laughs> and she seems like she's kind of like stepped back a little bit from it but she went through like an animation yeah. phase and anime but she's it's it, it's funny to see the difference with like me to her She's so much more committed to doing it every day. Um, and like the quality of what she's producing is amazing. Um, but she has other interests too. Like she, uh, she's almost 13. It's like, she's really good at makeup, not in a crazy, scary way. Um, <laughs> but like, she like, likes all the products and the tutorials and like knows how to, knows how to do some really cool things. Um, she likes music. She likes baking. We were talking about this summer because you get to that awkward age where you're like, I don't really know what you're going to do this summer. She's got like a week of volleyball camp. And other than that, I was like, I don't know. You've been talking a lot about baking. Like, why don't we set up a program of like, come up with what you want to bake this summer. We'll make sure you have the ingredients and have some friends over a couple times for that. Miles is, he was never a draw all the time kind of kid. He's, he's definitely got a creative, um, strong English. English strong reading brain um, but he's a video game kid he's pretty pretty seriously in the video games um, a couple of years ago he flipped a switch and he was like I'm into healthy eating and working out and we we're like great I don't know where that <laughs> came, came from but like good for you and he's pretty self-motivated on that but like can you talk to our son about that? <laughs> yeah the yeah, it just, it just came out of like nowhere. But like, he's got like so much energy. He's got more energy now, I think, than he did when he was like eight or 10. So I'm like, okay, go hit the punching bag downstairs. Yeah. and Like, go get rid of that energy. Um, but is, uh, when you say the, the video game stuff, is he into like, serious video game stuff? Or is he just like to play video games? Yeah, it's like, like serious serious video games it's um, like trash talking and hacking and he still plays minecraft which is funny to me because i'm like every time i look at it i'm just like i just remember like reading you this minecraft book when you were like five <laughs> and being like this is such an ugly game because like we ha had to play with pixels because there was nothing better and now you guys are playing with pixels yeah and there's so much more but like you know it's it's a lot more than that now i, I give it respect but um <laughs> We we did this ages ago. You can't do this. This was my. Era. It's just aesthetically uh, ugly to me. That's what continually bothers me. Yeah. About, about Minecraft, like I just can't even look at it. I'm like, what? Why? I don't. It's, I don't know. The, I, the I, blockiness. I I understand it for like some of the kids. Like in Charlie's case, like I think he likes it because he's he he gets to be an engineer. Oh yeah. And so it's. it's it, I mean, it's like it's. It's definitely the best of the games that he plays. It's like, you know, the other ones yeah. are like shooter survival type things, yeah. but. <laughs> I'm going to kill you. I'm going to dance on you after you're dead. One of those, uh, those type of games. Oh, yeah. Charlie, I've gotten into those, which I'm, I'm happy about. We've, uh, we've limited that side of it, but, um, the, uh, 
the Minecraft, he definitely plays uh, way, or not, he doesn't even do Minecraft with anybody else besides his one friend, and all they do is just build stuff the entire time. Yeah. Like, he's not even. Yeah, I mean, it's like this equivalent of Legos, right? Like, yep. It's pretty amazing if you just kind of let them go with it, what they what they make, but. Um, the, uh, like, I, I'm pretty sure at this point, Charlie is not gonna end up being an artist. Um, and I'm okay with yep. that. I think Lauren's yeah. okay with that. I don't, I don't think we have any hesitation like, oh, well, how dare he skip the family legacy? Um, but uh, it's, it's, he does have like the mathematician thing that I've just never been able to, to manage. Like he is, he is so good at the like analytical side of things and the subjective stuff he just can't stand. Yeah. Like right uh, Yeah. Uh, and I asked him about it the other day and he's like, well, there's no rules. <laughs> like, like, I know how to do this because there's rules. I'm like, yeah, but don't you want to have fun and, like, make something wild? And he's like, yeah, but if someone told me what to do, it'd be so much easier. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, were, were you good in other subjects in school? Yeah, I, lo I loved school. I just was a little school nerd. I loved um, science a lot. And I think in junior high, my teachers were like, yep. Like she's going into science. And then I just kind of like flaked out once I hit high school. Um, and I really liked math and I kind of liked programming, but things that I like tapped out like towards the end of high school. And it helped me with college because I went for computer graphics and we did actually have to take programming. And I did have to, you know, code my website back in the day. And yeah. Whatever other baloney. But like you quickly realize like, oh, like, I can do it and I have fun doing it, but like, it's not my, once you get to like bigger and bigger things in life, you realize like, yeah, I'm just not great at that. <laughs> like, it's not my, you don't really know until you, you go through certain phases where you're like, yeah, that's, that's not it. Well, it, and, especially like the coding side of things, it's, it's like, you almost have to be a mathematician, pure and simple in order to understand half of that language that goes into yeah. that. It is such a interesting sort of like you have to understand calculus and all these things that you wouldn't think, you know, are, are your go to's. We have a, a nephew that started out in that. Now he's he switched. He really loved writing. And so he shifted to sort of creative writing. Yeah. Um, and it's just the math part and the science part of it was too tough. Yeah. Um, the uh, I'm seeing AJ said Mike Petrick should come out our way uh, if he and then he could join us for for. Um, uh, great, great groups and whatnot, but you know, he gets to stay in that Chicago. Mike's, I think Mike's in Chicago, if I remember correctly, uh, where it's you know was twenty degrees below zero for however many weeks. Um, did you grow up on the East Coast? Yes, I grew up south of Boston in a town called Weymouth. It's like right. a little bit south of Quincy, and I say town, but it's like it's really a city. Um, they just like to call it call it a town, but. Um, Yep, and then went to school at Syracuse, and then lived around Boston for a while. Dipped out to the Berkshires, pretty, pretty New England, solid. We lived up in Maine when I was really, really little for a couple of years. The the Burton nerdy years were up in Maine. <laughs> did you? So wait, did you ever have a Maine? We were just talking about accents tonight. Yeah. Uh, yep. Did you ever have a like? A little, a little Bert and Ernie accent, <laughs> a little accent of sorts. No, but if I thought about it, I probably could recreate our. We had very lovely neighbors. We like really didn't have. I think our closest neighbor was like a half a mile down the road. We were really in the woods, um, yeah. up near Bangor, and um, the lovely family that <laughs> was so nice to us and helpful with us when we had some pretty tough winters. Um, she, she, they had very strong main accents. I'd have to, I'm too tired probably to pull up. If we, if I get more tired, my, my Boston accent will come out. That's, yeah. that's really what's going to happen. But I don't believe you that they had main accents unless you do it. Unless you, <laughs> it sounds like a fake story to me, unless you're willing to prove it by pretending to have a main accent. Um, I, we were, we were talking about all the different variables in my wife. I'm going to call her out right now. Uh, 
she <laughs> she kept on saying like oh you have this she was we were talking to her parents and she said you have this really cute accent thing that you do uh and i'm thinking like no she's she's actually saying i have this accent thing that bothers her and she's saying cute just to save face now she's saying no that's not true that she really was being nice but um, that you you have an accent or your family uh i have little bits of accent that show up where uh, did you grow up Mark? i grew up in the midwest i grew up in minnesota and oh. so if you listen there's the the key ones are uh p-e-n and p-i-n i can't say the difference between uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah they just end for both of those uh, i say the word dragon instead of dragon i said dragon uh and it's yep. the, like speed thing i don't know what it is uh and then um like those again the bag uh i i, I have problems with certain words but then um uh uh white i start with a huh so it's ho white and <laughs> ho whale and those things and so it's like some some small stuff um but some folks in my family my my mom specifically does have some very distinct like you know uh major and the words along that lines but it doesn't show up that much in me at least i don't think it does not to the point where people are like oh wow that's uh you sound like you're from the movie fargo it's nothing of that sort um yeah and i i, I family was from a lot of different places in the midwest so it's not like we had a very distinct like sounding um uh accent that showed up all the time but uh it's there if you listen. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. So. Had to be one of those uh, linguistic detectives to, to yeah. pick up on. I've I've never noticed you having any type of specific accent. Good. I'm not. I, I don't even care. I, what I don't want to have is like a really super pronounced accent. But I don't mind that I have these like silly words that I struggle with. Um. But it's all it's all about the vowels in my case. Yeah. I can't I can't do it. Um. AJ just said, well, squad, it's sleepy time now for me. Talk soon. Uh, that uh, we'll have to talk at some point. AJ, all of us are going to do a, a meetup at some point. I got to figure out what I'm going to actually share with people because I haven't written anything in a long uh -oh. time. Uh oh. Yeah. No, Better I'm, get to it. Yeah, He's I know. Got, I think we were talking about, I think you've got almost a month from what we were talking about earlier. So I have an idea that, that I really need to put down on paper. Uh, I just haven't done it yet. And I think it's a really fun idea. Um, that's a new idea. I've, I've I've talked about some other ones in the past that are kind of like I don't want to say they're dead in the water, but they're just they're not on the top of my uh, agenda at this point. But I have one that could be a lot of fun if done the right way. That I just yeah, part of it is I need advice on how to set up the the uh, the system in which the book works. Um, yeah. But we'll we'll get into it. We'll I have one of those. It too that's one i will talk about that next time because i've got one of those where it's uh it's not the it's not the standard it's got some sort of a structure to it that it's yeah been hard for me to tackle but i feel like it's a good idea so i shouldn't keep sleeping on it yeah i mean i basically i need less of a like edit and i need more of a sounding board for like okay do i start it this way or do i start it this way because that will affect the rest oh, of the board yeah. it plays out um and sort of wrapping my head around that that side of it um but some of that will just be i just need some some input from folks that i uh i haven't gotten uh from others in a while so um i'm just uh, watching how how uh so this is still the postcard correct i don't know what i'm doing mark <laughs> I'm just okay. going with it. I, will this end up as anything? I don't know. How? I've got, I mean, you got ooh. you got a week. Right? I got a week, but I got like three other things to do. <laughs> we'll see. Well, you'll get there. You'll get, get there. I'm. Uh, I have faith. Oh yeah, let me see. Can... I I should probably start wrapping it up too. So, oh look at those dinosaurs. Those look great. I haven't seen them since their faces were on. I'm trying to figure out, like, I want to put some other, like, I, this is really all it was going to be was just these dinosaurs that are dancing around this volcano exploding. Um, but I want to put some other, like, flora. Yeah. Out, like, yeah. But, like, I kind of like the sparseness of it. But just some other, like, just even just little lines that imply. Oh. I'm trying to figure 
That would be cool to have like just the outlines of leaves and things. So yeah. it's not overpowering that. Though, because I really love, these are trees to me right now. Uh, weird. I don't know what they are. Prehistoric yeah. trees. Uh, and I don't want to do something like this is really angular for the most part. What about so, the bodies of the dinosaurs they're eating? <laughs> what? Aren't they, they're, they're meat eaters, aren't they? What are they eating at this party? Uh, yeah, I mean, I gotta add that to it too. I was thinking- uh, <laughs> Too dark, forget Well, it. I was thinking of like, I could put little like flags in their hand or something that <laughs> like little streamers and stuff. So it feels more party-like as well. Streamers are uh, definitely more kid-friendly. Yeah. I mean, that so. may be enough to just like do some streamers. Yeah, no, them. streamers would be cool. And then you could, those could be like outliney and could kind of- Yeah. It'd be cool to see it like, you know, motion the the motion of the streamer is kind of adding yeah. to the motion of the piece yeah. right like a little swirly what I, what, I, what I don't want to do though is i don't want to like i want to keep the curve for the most part on the dinosaur's heads as far as value so like whatever i'm going to do like i'm pulling out this this posca marker to play around with potentially a uh like line work or something really light in the background versus yep. a little heavy sort of color you don't uh, want to compete with yeah. the, the faces. Yeah, and the so the cur yeah. curves sort of jump. But I'm gonna I should put something in their hands. I'm trying to, what would they eat? Just meat? <laughs> Chicken wings. Um I guess yeah, it doesn't have to be tied to maybe, the specific maybe, area. maybe don't do the food, maybe do the, the streamers or flags or I mean I like the idea or... of like them having something that they're eating, but the challenge is like because they're dinosaurs and it's about a volcano and uh whatnot i don't well, want to do something that's modern party hat so what? you've already you've already <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean what uh, about ice cream like mm, that's a good ice cream cones ice cream party that could be like again the antithesis of like the shape of the yeah okay i, I like it i can do that and it's gonna melt fast they better <laughs> yeah they better eat them before but it melts from the just, exploding. I still think streamers, yeah. some streamers that go like, yeah, in, yeah. Sort of, you know, even if I did like, wow, this marker, I thought this marker would be darker. It's not dark enough. I'll have to use a different marker. Um, but streamers can get me there. Okay. We'll get there. Maybe some, um, some text. Are you a, are you a text in the, the uh, illustration person? I am, but maybe not on this one just because of, uh, the, what I've been doing, especially for like the, the kidlet art postcard is doing a separate bar underneath. So I don't have to worry about the type in these. Gotcha. But at some point, uh, I mean, I could put some type in here. I just don't know what space I would put the type in, in a case like this, but I, there's a way to do it. I'm going to do a little bunting because bunting always feels like party. It does. Yeah. Of some sort. Okay. All right, Mark. I well, yes. think I'm going to, I'm gonna wrap it up here. I can't believe I even. It was it was the good times and the good chat that kept me up so late. And then your your kids will blame me tomorrow when you're like trying to drive them to school and running off the road. Uh, <laughs> you stayed up so late. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining me tonight, and especially for for jumping in last minute because I know it was sort of a hey, you got two days if you're in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really, I, I've been dying to have you on here for so long. And it was, uh, like I said, my wife, it was multiple exclamation points that Gina's joining. Um, when she saw that, uh, you had, you had said, okay. Um, and so we have been super appreciative of the fact that you took the time with us tonight. And for those that, uh, again, um, uh, don't know your work, Gina Perry, uh, are you, it's, uh, Gina Perry underscore books on Instagram. Yep. And your website is just, just GinaPerry.com, right? GinaPerry.com. Yep. Yeah, you got lucky on that one. Well, well, I'm I'm old, Mark. That's really all it is. And I had a website right out of college and never let it go. Yeah, that's that's smart. I didn't get at it fast enough. And so Mark Hoffman is a totally different person. Uh, uh, well, thank you for having yeah me too because i didn't say no out of any obviously it's a great honor to be on 
gab and doodle. I don't feel quite worthy because you've got just the most amazing illustrators on. Um, it turns out that I can't talk and draw at the same time. If you noticed, I stopped drawing when I was talking. <laughs> I, I didn't know um, that, but um, you deserve to be up there with all these <laughs> folks. And, and again, for those that weren't there at the beginning, uh, that are, are just tuning in or anything of the sort, Gina's the one that started Kidlit Art Postcard uh, hashtag that so many people use for promotion now. And we shall be thankful to you for uh, uh, for taking the time and, and starting something that everybody is benefiting from. You know, it's hard, it's hard enough these days to be an illustrator. Why make it harder? Let's make it easier and cheaper. You know, sending things in the mail and and printer and all that and hopefully I know I know it's helped a lot of people which is it really feels good and it's it's like it's a great day online if you're if you're over yeah. the online vibes like first Thursday of the month give it a go because it's just like a stream of really great work and meeting new people when we're talking about starting in the field and not like knowing your people yet yep that's how you meet your, your people right like it's a place to place to connect and find some new i always find new people to to follow and be inspired by so goody goody all good okay well, Look. well thank you again we uh we and i say we because it's not just me really really appreciate it and uh go get some rest will do i'll, I'll look forward to the dinosaur you're gonna finish those up tonight i will <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to probably start another session here just to finish the last little bit that goes with this, but I will get this done tonight. Um, All right. We always get it done. So, um, otherwise, go say hello to the kiddos and uh, uh, really appreciate it. And I will talk to you soon. Great to talk to you tonight, okay. Mark. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. All right. So, uh, I'm going to continue to build a couple last little things on this just to get bunting in here and things that are going to help sell party and if i can get this done in the next 14 minutes that'd be amazing um but for those that are tuning in that uh have been listening and uh have any questions about uh, me uh our talk that we had tonight or questions that arose from that um any questions that you may have about the industry or things of that sort feel free to ask them in the comments and i will try to answer uh, to the best of my ability. The only thing I can't answer is questions that were directed at Gina because those are Gina questions and not mine. But, uh, oh, wow. That's, I just looked at my phone that's recording this and it's like back like three hours into the conversation. Let's see if, uh, yeah, that's, that's hard to look at it that way. Um, my wife is falling asleep. Uh, that's okay. You can fall asleep. It's late. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Look and see if there's any other things that I missed here. I think we're pretty good. Um, so again, if there's comments or questions, just throw them in that chat. Um, for anybody that's tuning in and goes, why is Mark's voice so gravelly tonight? Today was the first day of teaching for the semester. And so I talked uh, a lot going over syllabi and talking about assignments and talking about um, is my favorite class to teach, which is a professional practice class. Um, and so we talked a lot about sort of um, business stuff and uh, challenges that students will face uh, and those kinds of things. Um, and uh, the problem is there's so much information that I talked for basically three hours straight for two classes in a row and my voice, especially at the beginning of the semester, bears the brunt of it. Uh, and so I get gravelly and more, uh, I actually sound, in my opinion, I get this like kind of sexy voice. <laughs> my wife's falling asleep. She's not hearing this. Um, I, I always feel like, oh, it sounds better. I got this like, I sound cool. Um, oh, now she's laughing. She's laughing because she agrees. I'm pretty sure that's what she's laughing about. Um, but I don't know why she's still laughing. That's concerning. Um, but uh, it's the best thing. When I get a cold, 
I don't know if anybody's ever heard me on here with a cold. Oh man, I get a, a nice baritone, a pretty good baritone, and I'll sit there and sing in my car for hours. Like I could just, uh, there's part of me that goes, if it wasn't for the like, the horrible snots and coughing and whatnot, getting a cold is pretty cool, because uh, I sound awesome. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm putting in some little bunting. I'm trying to figure out if I want to put in any other like, like one that comes down this way. I'm worried about like, I don't want it to be too balanced and sort of like, should I have one that comes up to this tree over here or is that too much? I'm trying to figure it out. Maybe I should put the stuff in their hands, but I'm going to give them little like fun little things they're holding on to and whatnot. I should probably put that in now. It's a question. Do I want to use some of these? It's like I could put stripes on their hats. Maybe I'll do that because it feels more. I love stripes. I don't like to wear stripes. Because they make me look bigger than I actually am. Um, but I do love stripes on things. Like drawing them in. I wonder why. Because I wear plaid. You would think I would want to draw plaid all the time. But plaid sucks to draw so. Maybe you don't want to wonder that, but uh, but I do love stripes. I don't know if this is like if I should make this more problematic, like having the lava come down, uh, or if I should just let it go spurting out the top. Uh, who's still watching? Who wants to voice voice an opinion? Should I um, should I have this lava that's part of the party starting to come back down? Because if I do, I need to do it. It's not. It won't take that much to do it. But I, it's a question of is it worth it? Need people's opinion. No one, no one's jumping in. Everybody's afraid. There's no wrong opinions here. If someone says do it, then I do it. If someone says don't do it, then I don't do it. Show some lava is my vote. There you go. Bear Edwards coming through for the win. Bear Edwards, you you win tonight's prize. Tonight's prize is, is um, I don't know why I first went to this in my head, but an air kiss from me. I don't know if you want it, but it is it is available. If you like it, uh, I can I can provide that at a moment's notice. Um, let me get some of that same sort of color. Where did I have that? Oh, it's this. Yes, let's grab it for this. Lava. Oh, actually, yeah. Maybe I want to do a little bit of lava streaming down it. Good call, Leanne Markle. You're right. I'm thinking if I did like, I did the fountain piece and maybe that's problematic if I start to do this like here. But I do like the idea of this like, lava coming back down that way and then what I can do is let's see if I can make a uh, let's do it like this let's take this section right here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut a little curve out of it like that and I'll do a little tiny lava flow that's coming over the edge uh, dory doodles CL like a lava coming back and maybe not drippy like blood, but maybe like a graphic fireworky shape. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was probably going to do with those. I'm wondering if I can get something that feels sort of let's see if I can get this in here. 
in a way that works. If I did something like this, is that too much? Does it need to be a longer strip of that? Let's do a longer strip of that. Let's see. Oh. So if I did this, I cut that curve. Is that silly? Does that look weird? I don't know if I'm, I'm behind it 100% right now, but we'll see. I can go put some other lava beans sprayed back in this way. Uh, do I have any more of this color? Ooh. Ooh. I don't want to have to make a new batch. I guess I can steal from this. Okay. Maybe this. I'll cut that section. Um, do we like that? That this part of it coming over the edge? Is it too silly to have drips? Actually, you know what? I like it better if I did this. It's a little weird. Now it's like dripping but it's got these weird flat shapes to it i don't know why i like that better but i do got some other curves out of this so i did this and then let's uh party vibes and what i'll do is i'll do some little like explosion so it does feel a little bit like um So it feels a little bit like, uh, what do I want to say? Like uh, like, uh, like uh, uh, fireworks. I can add that in. So if I did something like this, it was like, boom, lava party. Uh, how about a thinner, longer, wavy flow like path? I love your process. Thank you. Uh, so let's see. If we're talking about something like this, let's see if I. Oh no, I'll do it with that. Maybe I'll do it with Let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Oh wait, I think I get it. Aha! I think I know what you mean by a wavy path. Oh yes, we're gonna do a draw this in my style. I mean, not my style, draw this in your style competition. Uh, for those that are interested, um, coming up here in a week or so, we're gonna put out the, the official thing, but it's, um, uh, you can win a book signed by me. So if you have any interest, do it. So I can do something like this. So it's like, ooh, that's better. That works better, much better. All I gotta do is just cut it at the right spot and then it has this little lava flow. Boop. That's a little, I need to cut it a better angle than that. I'm gonna run out of time, aren't I? It's 11.58. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do, folks. I'm going to stop this feed. I'm gonna start it again and I'll finish off the last little bit of this uh, in a matter of a second. What I gotta do is I gotta stop the feed. It's gonna take about two minutes. I'll come back on. If you're interested in um, continuing, I will be back on once I post this and it will be available for you to come back and just continue. And I'll do a few little touch-ups to this and then we'll rock out for the night. Um, so I'm gonna hit stop, bear with me. Two minutes, you will see my feed come back up saying I'm live again. All right, y'all have a lovely time waiting. Ha ha, bye. Um, welcome to uh, part two of my night gabbing and doodling with Gina Perry. Gina has left us for the night. It got too late. Gina had to get some, some sleep. I, on the other hand, need some sleep, but I'm not going to take it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to continue making this piece. Um, and so I don't have a ton to do, but I want to finish it 
live so people can see what happens. So I'm going to come back to it. For those that were tuning in before, pick up with me. We'll get going. For those that are new to it, um, I'm making a piece uh, about dinosaurs partying because a volcano erupted. Whether that's good or bad, that's, that's uh, questionable. Um, but for now, that's what the piece is. And so I'm going to keep working. I got a couple things I'm going to do. What I need from everybody that's watching, though, is I need some advice. And what I need with the advice is, should I? Like right now, I can just do this little lava flow that's coming down the edge, which works absolutely fine. There. I have no problem with it. Um, what I need to question, though, is, is that enough? Or should I put in some other little things that imply that lava is shooting up in the air and dripping back down, which I can do. The challenge that I have with this and why I sort of question it is just, I had done an illustration of a fountain that was erupting before, or a fountain that was spraying up and it had similar arcs. So I don't know if I wanna do that yet. If it's better just to say, hey, I should just use this little lava stream that's going down the center. And so what I need from people is to tell me, should I do it without these three at the top? Or should I do all of it? That's the question at hand. Who has an opinion? I'm waiting to hear opinions. You get to decide. You get to be a player in this. I'm going to darken this up a little bit so it matches the color there. That's a quick sort of thing, but I'm leaving it there until I can figure out whether I like it with or without any people to see and figure out if they like it. So, folks that have joined me, more lava, someone says. Jace, J, uh, Josh Monk Ward says that, Illustrated. As they're, uh, what do you mean, as they're looking up, Illustrated. Did I miss something to do this? As they were looking up, a reference to something that I missed. Without the top, I think. But more arc in the lava, if possible. Hmm. So you want it to be more like curvy, like shooting out this way. I'm I'm sort of I kind of dig this like tighter thing. I might make these a little bit smaller, but like I, I think curve, like I can do this so it curves and maybe cut it off at this point. But I'm rather than going out to the edges, I'm thinking about keeping it sort of centered at the top. Um okay, let me at least darken this. I'll get that stuck down, then we'll, we'll sort of arrange those others. Um, but I need to do a little bit of a paint job on this. And hopefully that paint is still a little bit active. It is. Since so I can get in here and put a little bit of brown on it. And even, I'm going to have to dip into some other colors real quick. Bear with me. A little bit of brown. A little bit of, what color purple is this? This is Deep Magenta. For those in the know, that's what it is. Deep Magenta and a little bit of yellow oxide. So raw sienna, yellow oxide, and a little bit of the uh, deep magenta combination of those should give me something that's gonna add a little touch of like uh, warmth to this and, or like earthier tone. So it's not just a pure bright orange fluorescent color. Sort of knock it down a peg, just so it's not so pure. I like the idea of the, the punch of orange that's in there. I just don't want it to be so over the top. So I'm gonna do is hit it with that. That should be enough to, to get me there. Make sure I don't leave any major thingy prints on it. Let that sit for a second. Uh, Oh, could curve like a drop. Oh, wait a second. What are we talking about here? The two in the middle. But not the third one. When you say that, Illustrated, like if I keep these, just get rid of this one. I mean, I can do I can do a variety of things to make it work. I just, let's uh, figure it out as we go along here. So I need to do a couple of things here. Uh, do I need shadows? I do need shadows underneath the tree there. That's silly that I didn't do that. Where's that color? There's that color right there. A little bit of this. A little bit of this guy, I think. Is. So I'll 
shadow where that tree was. Okay. Oh, wait. Let me get back down there. Curve my jaw. Okay, there we go. Laura Kazoo, what are you doing up this late? Did you just say kazoo, Lauren? Lulu. 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 Kazoo. What? Lulu, why did you get named Lulu? How did that become a name that people refer to as? Uh, top two dinos in the middle are looking straight up. The three streams would work. Oh, I got you. Okay. Got you. That's a good call. Good call. So it's not just an arbitrary they're looking up, but they're looking up for a specific reason. Bill Australia, this is why you get paid the big bucks. When I say big bucks, big bucks, I mean none. But, you know. That's the way life goes sometimes. So let's see, we got that. Let's uh, oh, let's get a blade here. Let's go and cut that. Get rid of this little piece here. There's a little lava stream there. Let's go stick these guys in. So it was one on this side. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cut this one a little bit different. Usher started it. Yeah, okay. I just, it's, I mean, it was there when I got there. I think people were already calling you Lulu. Um, do you still get called that, or was that just a workplace thing? Is that just us crazy kiddos that did that? Us wild, wild nutso people that said, hey, we're going to call you this silly name and you're going to deal with it. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to see if I can get a different curve out of this one. Just so it feels a little bit more, like, interesting there. So if I did that, what I don't want it to be is the same height. So what I probably got to do is, like, this is the the last minute I'm trying to get this guy to work. Uh, where was the other piece? I had a whole other piece that was a different curve. Oh, it's this one right here. I could go and get like boom. So it sort of looks like that. Uh, but what I want to do again because I do not like the texture on this one yet. I want to go get that one maybe tweaked a little bit. So a little bit of that sort of, again, knocking it down into an earthier tone. It's just not such a pure red, orange color. There's a little curly Q there, and this one needs the same thing. And I will tweak this one after the fact with cutting it. I know this is riveting for me talking about I'm going to cut a piece to a different shape. But, you know, you get what you paid for, and you paid nothing for this, so there you go. Okay. I, love to, I feel like a mime or something, because I can't talk, and like a little fly with Vincent Price's head watching you from above. Or you gotta say something that'll keep Lauren awake because Lauren's falling asleep. She's she's drifting away into slumberland. Okay, here we go. We're gonna get some paste, 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 glue, glue, glue. Stick it down here for for you. There we go. There's one down. I will add white on top of those later. This one I'm going to cut down so it's a little bit thinner and maybe a little bit more. I'm going to do this because I do like this. It's going to sound weird. No one's going to understand why I do this. Um, I like that there's a little tiny miscut 
on the previous piece. So I'm gonna do that little miscut here too. Just so it feels a little awkward right there and not perfect. I'm gonna go take it, I'm gonna stick it down right. Oh, that's too close to the same height. Let's change it right there. That works for me. So that little bit right there is important to me, so I'm gonna keep that. Okay, now what we're gonna do, I'm gonna glue the back of this. Let's go and let's stick this down. So it's out of the way. Let that set for a second and dry. Posca marker. I'm gonna add our lines back into this so it feels like it's part of that same lava. Mr. Lava Lava. Mmm. This guy needs to be charged. That's got some nice. Still not perfect, but it's, uh, it's still a little sort of transparent, so we're going to amp it up. That's because there's some glue on the surface. Uh, where can I, I need like a sketchbook or something. To, I guess I can do it on here, that's fine. Let's get that guy going. There we go. Couple little stripes on this guy here. And maybe, maybe. Uh, did I sketch this out beforehand or just wing it? Laura, you want to see my sketch that I went with? It's this. That's my sketch. <laughs> so you can see, here's what I ended up with. That's where it started. <laughs> It's the dumbest sketch in the world. Uh, but I had sketched this last week uh, as an idea for something in the background. And then uh, this is what it was. And this is what it's turned into. So, you know, I hope it's an improvement over the sketch. <laughs> I hope. It may not be, but I hope it is. Uh, so let's see. I'm going to do a couple little lines down this. Show off the flow of lava. Whoa, swirly. There's my lava, Mr. Lava Lava. Mm. Okay, let's get that blade out of the way. Now let's go put some other, I don't think this is gonna do much if I do that. Yeah, it's not the biggest dramatic uh, white that I'm getting in there. And again, I could probably try with this one, but this one, again, may not be all that special either. I'm just wondering, can I get some other little like things that feel like uh, confetti in here. So even just, what I might do is just for, do this. I don't want it to look like snow, but maybe that's even funnier because it's got a, uh, the ice age snow is going to hit them. little pops of white. Here's the hard part is making sure that it doesn't feel too evenly spaced. This is like white ash that is falling down into this space.
just to add to that confetti. Uh, gal illustration. What is the story behind this? I joined late. Um, so, uh, I wanted to draw dinosaurs last week or groundhog last week. I drew a groundhog. This time it's, I'm going to do the dinosaurs that I wanted to draw. And what I really wanted to do, and this is the sketch that I just showed to Laura Kazoo there. Um, I really wanted a tree that looked like that. And so I drew trees, or I didn't draw them. I cut out shapes that look like that. And I wanted clunky dinosaurs. And so this is dinosaurs having a party around a lava explosion uh, from a volcano. And uh, I'm going to use it for probably kid lit postcard day. Um, but uh, that's what this is. <laughs> I don't really know exactly what it means, but uh, there's. I'm going to do a couple other little touches on things, but uh, that's the gist of this guy. It's not the, it's not the most sane thing that I've ever done, but it's... Uh, I like it so far. I'm okay with it. It feels fun. It feels festive. Uh, yeah, this is just festive lava, right? Like they're not going to die, right? Um, well, may maybe. Maybe they might. I don't know. That's, uh, that's for me to know and you to find out. Wait, what? That's, um, yes, there's a possibility that that might be what is going to occur. This is the big party, and they think, hey, everything's awesome because we're having a party. There's this big explosion, like fireworks. But in reality, uh, Dunzo, uh, they're, they're on their way to a uh, to the grave. I'll put in some orange party colors. Uh, yeah, this is like, this is, this is the equivalent of, uh, you know, when the, the Y2K happened, everybody was worried that um, the end was near, that the whole world was going to come crashing down. This is their Y2K party, but it's, uh, you know, maybe a different number. It's their Y2, uh-oh, 50 billion years ago party. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, they're not going to, uh, to live a very long time because it is nearing the end. The end is nigh. These two are going to have some fun little, uh, dry they're partying like it's 1999999999999 BC streamers there let's uh this guy can have a little not party streamers we're gonna call these little flags of some sort wait for it to dry wait for it to dry gotta 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 wait for it to dry I like this orange so I'm gonna actually like This off and on right there because it's kind of like a, a weird little end to that. Um, okay, let's see. Let me do this guy here. A little party thing like that. A 
how much do I have right now? So I'm trying to figure out, do they all need those? And if so, I might actually go and make this. Let's see this one here. A little bit of a different color. Just those three. I like those three. That's good. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Now, do I want to add any other little variables? Do I want to give them eyebrows or anything? I feel like they don't necessarily need it, but I could do something that's a little bit more like subtle eyebrows, like not distinct dark eyebrows. I feel like this one's like up on top of the tree, which is kind of funny in its own, in its own fun way. Um, okay. And then, I need to make sure I stick down all these things, and I'm going to go back and just double check some colors, and that might be it for the night. It's a good thing I got cleaned up right there. What is that? Is that something that's on top or is that something that's underneath? Oh, that's on top. Okay, there's a little piece of glue. Um, okay, so what do I need to do? What was I going to do? I was going to glue that. I need to touch up a couple little spots. And I need to touch up their teeth. Make sure they're... The whiter, the better. So if it's something that's big that you're going to notice they're not quite white, I want to make sure those are relatively white. So it's those that are really the issue. Um, shoot, what was I going to do? I stuck that down. I don't see if there's any other like major issues. This one is a... bit of a challenge there because that one got a little funky. Um, they got those. Should I put glasses on any of them? I don't think I need to. That may be it. That may be it, party people. Let's get... I got all the colors that I need there. Yes, yes, yes. I don't think I need any of the rest of these. These can go away. So I'm just going to clean up the space. I'll show it off on a nice clean uh, or cleanish surface here in a matter of a second. Um, maybe do this. Let's see. I just said may go do this, but it sounded like mega do do, which is fun too. It's a mega doo doo. Oof. It came out kind of strong out of the marker there. Yeah, let's see. Mega doo doo. Sorry, Gina. We're hoping this is going to stay nice and clean. I'm talking about Mega Doo Doo now. Uh, Laura Kazoo, thank you for saying that you love them so much. Laura, I forgot that you and Gina were, were roomies back in the day. That was brought up again. I also forgot that she worked at a, a what do you call it? A olive jar. That's what I was mentioned. Yes. I knew it back a while ago and I knew there were those kind of 
connections. I just spaced on it. Okay, uh, that I think is enough of those. Now I'm gonna do is just any light little bit of touch up that needs to happen. Do -do 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 -do. I really like. Do I need? Do I need other little streams of that? I don't think I do. I think it's problematic if I do that, just com composition-wise. Um, okay, so for those that have tuned in uh, from the beginning, I thank you for uh, sticking with me, especially when I went jump to a part two, especially when it's only been a part two. Part two is only a half an hour. It's not that long. Um, first part is four hours, so... This is a, it's only a short little half hour session for this part two. Um, I will post all of this uh, shortly on Instagram when I'm done here. That will go up almost immediately. But I will post this to YouTube uh, shortly thereafter. I need to combine the two videos together into one singular thing. That's, that happens when I get to these double sessions. Um, but uh, I... Uh, Illustrated, it is cooked. It's done. Who needs anything else? This one's over and done. Let's, uh, yeah, I can do this. Clean up the bottom half so it's not as colorful there. And then I'll get it nice and centered for everybody. Um, here, I'll do this even. I'll zoom in so people can see some of the like more fun details. Bippity bop, bippity boop, 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 boop. Uh, okay, so let me zoom this back out, which basically means I'm just moving my. Oh, it's falling down. I don't want that. There we go. So that's the sort of finish of this guy. Um, I will post this in the coming week. Uh, essentially, it's showing the, the finished product after I do a little bit of digital touch-up. Um, but this is... Oh, you know what I love that's fun? Oh, wow. Okay. People are probably not going to appreciate this. This bunting goes in front of this tree and behind this. But this tree is way in front of that. And this dinosaur is in between them. This is the thing that, like, uh, that should not be done. And I didn't even factor it in. But I think it's an amazing part of this piece. That may be my favorite thing in the whole thing is the fact that that's so screwed up perspective-wise. Um, anyways, so this is the finished product. Let me can I zoom out anymore. Whoa, that's too much because then you get to see my belly. Uh, a little bit. There we go. Uh, finished product. Um, I will be back next week. Um, I need to post, uh, in fact, I need to do it this weekend right away. In fact, maybe tomorrow I got to do it. Um, the lineup for February. Um, so I will be posting that hopefully this weekend. Um, and then we'll be back next Thursday at 8 PM with another lovely guest. Uh, I forget who it is cause I haven't done the ads yet. So it's, drawn a blank at this point um otherwise y'all go have a lovely evening i will see you next week on gavin doodle bye <laughs>